In recognition of guests, the Honourable Premier. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and welcome back to my colleagues uh, for another day of debate on the Legislature. Welcome to those who have joined us uh, in the uh, uh, public gallery. I think I recognize under the mask the father of our Minister of Finance, who's probably here to uh, see his, uh, be proud of his son deliver uh, what I think will be a very impressive capital budget today, so welcome to all. Uh, this morning, Mr. Speaker, like many in the legislature, I had the chance to meet with uh, uh, two uh, groups of bright young grade nine students who are participating in the Take Your Kid to Work today. Two of them are here, Olivia and Kennedy, uh, who were in uh, to uh, have a nice little Q&A uh, in the cabinet room with, 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 with me, and uh, uh, we talked about the future potential careers there are for so many in the public service. and. I tried to uh, explain to them that public service, as I said yesterday, is a, is a higher calling. It's an important calling and, and need it more so than ever before. So I think I can speak for all, and I'm sure many will speak, but I think our future is bright here, and I think we're in good hands. So, so welcome to all. Um, uh, Mr. Speaker, last night I had a chance to meet with uh, Nancy Mannix uh, from the Palix Foundation. Uh, she's here from Alberta and had a, a couple of sessions yesterday at UPEI talking with stakeholders and academics and decision makers uh, about the, the brain story. And if you're not familiar with that, I know many in here are, uh, but if you're not familiar, you should check that out. It's connection to mental health and addictions, among other things. Uh, it's, 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 it's quite an amazing piece of, uh, uh, of development, really, uh, through uh, Harvard University and Oxford University and so many others. And it's, uh, it's, it's really the future of ensuring that we're uh, using science and data to make decisions uh, and helping to inform public policy about the appropriate upstream investments that need to be made and supports for the next generation. So I want to thank uh, Nancy for being here and for her interest in PEI. Uh, finally, Mr. Speaker, this morning I had the great privilege to join yourself, uh, uh, Chief Darlene Bernard of the Lennox Island First Nation and representatives of Parks Canada uh, for what was a wonderful um, smudging ceremony at Province House next door, which is under construction. It was a, um, an emotional and moving uh, ceremony. Uh, afterwards, we had uh, what I would probably describe as a, as a pretty raw discussion about uh, uh, truth and reconciliation. Uh, the conversation kind of took the form under the leadership of uh, Elder Matilda Knockwood Snake and kind of a, we, we formed a circle and it uh, was a talking circle and much of the conversation was about uh, how the construction of Province House sort of brick by brick being taken apart and put back together is essentially the future pathway we're kind of on with our, uh, with our future relations with First Nations and democracy in general. And, uh, you know, uh, I think at one point it was said that we have a proud history of Canadians, but there's a whole lot of history that we're not proud of, that we're ashamed of, that we can't be afraid to talk about and we can't not talk about. Uh, and it was, as I said, it was a moving ceremony and, and uh, it was a smudge and a prayer. Uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, it was organized by all the way with Janine Woldridge, Chief Bernard. Uh, and they really wanted to, they're going to plant within the walls uh, the four, uh, they're going to, uh, tobacco and cedar and, 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 uh, and, and the four medicines, they're going to put that in the wall with the hope that what comes next from Province House will be something different than what it was when it first started. So it was an honor to be there, Mr. Speaker, and as always, it's a wonderful opportunity to be there with you. So thank you very much. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I too would like to welcome everybody back for the second day of this sitting. And particular welcome to the Minister of Finance, of course, who will deliver his first budget speech today, the capital budget. So we're all looking forward to that. And it's lovely that your parents are here today to be able to witness that. And uh, they're not the only parents of a member of the Legislative Assembly who are here today. My friend and colleague and the member for Tyne Valley Sherbrooke, her parents are here. So welcome to Angela and John. <laughs> lovely to see you. Um, and we also have a daughter, as the Premier welcomed a, a couple of students who were here um, at, upstairs in the, with the Cabinet, having, I think you put it, a nice little Q&A, which is coming, yes. just in a few, a few more Q than A, but it's coming. Um, we also, we, we have Gracie Murphy, who, who's here with us today, who is the daughter of the member for Charlottetown Victoria Park. So welcome, Gracie. It's lovely to have you too. Yesterday, uh, I applauded 
the rural municipality of West River for the efforts that they made uh, post Fiona. And I want to talk again about that municipality because they have just installed a new community fridge there. Um, and the, the West River team is made by, uh, led by Megan Mitchell, and, and of course it takes many volunteers to make this happen, a lot of planning. And uh, we, we're seeing these community fridges popping up across the province now. And that's a wonderful thing, and of course we all wish they weren't needed, but for as long as they are, um, uh, I think it's important that we express our gratitude, that how, how grateful we are for all the people who do make, make these things happen and fill in the gaps that are sadly still present. So I want to thank Megan Mitchell and, and the group of volunteers in West River who brought this together, uh, Griffin Service uh, Center um, who delivered the fridge. The fridge was donated. Um, the community has been, of course, very generous in terms of donating money and food to help get this initiative going. So thank you to everybody in West River for that. I also want to pass on congratulations to Rosemary Curley, who was just recently selected as the Rotary Club of Charlotte by the Rotary Club of Charlottetown Royalty to receive, receive their prestigious Mentor of the Year Award for 2022. And of course, Rosemary is well known to many in this legislature. She spent her life caring for and documenting the, the wildlife of Prince Edward Island, and she's a wildlife authority. Um, both with government, uh, with government in her working life and now as a volunteer. And she's authored a number of books and she continues to volunteer as the, um, and work as the president of Nature PEI. So congratulations to Rosemary. She'll be presented with her award at the Rotary's annual gala, which happens next Wednesday, November the 9th. Congratulations to Rosemary and thank you to everybody who made that happen. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. John member from Charlottetown West Royalty and third party house leader. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd also like to welcome everybody in the gallery watching and, and good luck to the, the Minister of Finance as he delivers the budget speed. I'll say to his daughters, you might just want to turn it down when that comes over to this side of the house. So, so no, I'm just kidding. You'll do just great. Um, just a few things, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, congratulations to the Special Olympics Award winners uh, last night. Um, uh, and as well as the exiting board members. I think they had a, a great gala there last night, so congratulations, a, a, a fine event. Uh, I want to say hello to, uh, to Lacey, Lacey Keown, who was recognized by Atlantic Canada's 30 Under 30 Innovators. Um, this is a pretty special award. It's done by the Atlantic Business Magazine. And if anybody knows Lacey, she's done an incredible job of giving people uh, access to movement. And, and she's, she's a dance coach. She's a life coach. She, she does a lot of special things for our community for a very long time. So congratulations. The Community Foundation of PEI recognized recently Dr. Trevor Jane uh, for his outstanding contribution to PEI citizens. He's done many programs like the COVID Warrior. He's a disaster medicine specialist. He's always constantly keeping us informed. So congratulations on, uh, on that uh, award. PEI's own uh, Alicia Corrigan was named player of a match in, in the uh, national, the ca Canadian national team, women, women's uh, team uh, in Auckland uh, recently, and they're at the World Cup. Uh, for, for women's rugby. So that's our very own Alicia Corgan. That's an incredible uh, accomplishment, and she's well on her way to, to, to being one of the major stars there. So congratulations. And again, best of luck to the UPI rugby team. Uh, they're, they, they won, uh, they won uh, recently, too, keeping on the rugby theme. They won recently. They're off to nationals. An incredible team. An amazing feat for them to win that for the first time ever, as well as the Holland College men's soccer team, who won the ACAA uh, crown just recently. Um, and, you know, we talked about Alex McCauley yesterday. I'm sure he'd be very, very proud of this team. They beat St. Thomas in penalty kicks to take the title. So congratulations to all these great Islanders. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just a quick note, honourable members. And I know we have a rule of uh, 45 seconds for members to uh, for, uh, uh, speak to the guests. I'm going to waive that rule today, if the members don't mind. I'm going to waive the rule and it's uh, take your work, your kid to work day or take your parents to work day. So <laughs> and I know there's a few, a few kids and parents in the gallery. So I'm going to waive that rule today if the members don't mind. No? Nope. Thank you for your support. The Honorable Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Stole my joke. Um, obviously, I want to recognize that my dad and his wife, Beryl, are here today. 
I did try to convince my 14-year-old to come to Dad's work today, and she chose another, didn't even choose her mother's location. She chose a friend's location. So I told her I could get her up on the fifth floor maybe for a picture, but I, that didn't work. So I went to the new plan, take your dad to work plan. <laughs> so I do appreciate all the support that, I, that I've got from, from my family. Um, and he was one of my drivers during the campaign and uh, helped, helped certainly uh, get me to where I am today. So I appreciate it. Uh, I can also confirm that Fox Meadow Golf Course is closed for the season because he is here today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member for Mermaid Stratford and the Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise. Um, hello to everybody from Mermaid Stratford that's tuning in and welcome to everybody that's in our gallery. It's always great to have people um, joining us. And I see Blake Doyle. Blake Doyle and I grew up in the same community just down the road from each other, so it's always nice to see you around. And um, Mr. Speaker, I went to the Special Olympics AGM and annual meeting or annual awards meeting last night. And can I just tell you that I don't think I've ever been in a more positive, uplifting room than it was last night. How each one of those athletes and coaches cheered on each other and how many hours of dedicated volunteer time there is put into Special Olympics. It's such a fantastic organization and you couldn't not smile and laugh throughout the whole thing. It was just, it was absolutely amazing and I was so happy that I could be there. And uh, there were two athletes of the year chosen yesterday, so just congratulations to Keegan Wade and to Janet Chartruck. We would know Janet because she was the one that joined the member from Tignish Palmer Road um, and defended legislation with him here last year. And I think we can all agree that she's a huge advocate for the rights of people with intellectual disabilities. And let me tell you, she was a firecracker on that stage last night. She kept Corey Tremere on his toes. <laughs> she was hilarious. And her father was also um, awarded a volunteer award. And it was just an excellent opportunity to celebrate those folks. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I too would like to, to welcome everyone here today, family members and, and uh, the three students we have here for Take Your Kid to Work Day, one of which uh, the member, the uh, leader of the official opposition mentioned is my daughter, Gracie. And it's funny, as a teacher, often we would have kids coming to work with their parents. And so I remember when she was first born, 14 years ago, that I used to think to myself how fun it would be when she came to work with me. And as the time got closer, I wasn't sure she was going to pick me. But in the end, <laughs> I was selected because I was the only one who doesn't work from home currently. So, you know, I, I feel very honored. I'm not, and uh, anyway, it was, a, it was a great morning being involved. Um, and it was really nice to have her here and be able to have lunch with her. Um, she's a student at Birchwood. Uh, intermediate and is on the volleyball team and she plays softball and is also in leadership and so I just look forward to to seeing what she has to say at the end of the day <laughs> and we'll have a great discussion I can imagine and um, I too attended the Special Olympics uh, in AGM and awards ceremony last night and echo everything I just my heart was so warm I think it was one of the most pleasant uh, events I've been to since being elected. I left feeling very humbled and inspired w with a really light heart, which is quite impressive after, you know, first day of legislature, first day being back in, going from morning until night. So to the organizers, to the volunteers, to the coaches, to the athletes, thank you for, for everything you do and for a really great evening. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member from Time Valley, Sherbrooke, and the Opposition Whip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise today and to participate in Take Your Parents to Work Day. <laughs> it's uh, uh, great to have my parents here. Uh, Angela Altas Binder and John Binder are here. Uh, I hope they enjoy the proceedings and they, I hope they uh, find this uh, quite interesting. Um, as well, I want to just say thanks to Gracie for joining us in our office today. It was lovely to have you there and, and I hope it wasn't too boring. Um, as well, I see Blake Doyle is here, Blake Doyle from the Summerside Chamber. So thank you, Blake, for joining us today. It's, it's wonderful to see you and uh, always uh, uh, wonderful to be able to meet with you and uh, to discuss uh, what your work with the Chamber and, uh, and what's happening in the Summerside business community. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. 
thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's certainly an honor to rise today and uh, welcome uh, everyone watching from home in Kensington, Malapak. I uh, want to take this time, uh, Mr. Speaker, to, to welcome two beautiful uh, ladies to the legislature today. So uh, we've got Olivia R. Snow, um, daughter of Brian and Tracy R. Snow, and uh, my beautiful daughter, Kennedy. Uh, she's uh, here with me today. Uh, and it's been uh, quite the experience, I think, for, for the two girls. Uh, we started off driving uh, down today with uh, calling back uh, some landlords, which was, was interesting drive down for them. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it was good. So uh, we're walking in, uh, Mr. Speaker, and Kennedy's following me down the stairs, and she goes, Dad, I'm nervous. And I said, what are you nervous for? You're not getting any questions today. <laughs> anyway, so welcome. This is the first time I've had a family member in the legislature, and uh, I'm certainly glad to have them both here. Thanks, Mr. The Honourable Member from Morrell, Dona, and the Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, it is wonderful to have everybody in the gallery today. Uh, uh, hello to everybody in uh, District 7, Morrell, Dona. Uh, my condolences. Uh, the Premier spoke uh, highly of Alex McCauley yesterday, so I just want to give my condolences to, uh, to Lawrence and to, to Jimmy and to Mary and uh, Gloria and, and the district. Um, uh, we, we are sorry for your loss. Um, I want to welcome the grade nine uh, students that are they're here today, uh, Olivia and uh, uh, Gracie. Uh, Kennedy, uh, welcome as well. Uh, your father is, is you know, one of the, uh, the finest MLAs that I've ever seen in this legislature, so uh, you should be very proud. And he speaks way more highly of you than we could ever speak of him, so uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's quite wonderful. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, Welcome uh, to Dave and uh, Beryl McLean, who have uh, in the gallery here today, and uh, no doubt a, a proud day for, for Dave as well. But uh, Mr. Speaker, um, uh, uh, Madame McLeod, as I would know her from a very long time ago, was one of my favorite teachers growing up, <clears throat> my great my French teacher, Mr. Aww. Speaker, and has developed into a, a, a very good friend and, and beach friend and, and friend of our family. So welcome. It is so wonderful to see you here in the legislature today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and it is a pleasure to be able to rise here in the legislature again today. Uh, I also want to welcome all the ones uh, that are in the gallery. It's great to see you here. Blake, uh, great to uh, see that you're able to join us here uh, today. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's been mentioned by uh, uh, different uh, ones here in the legislature, my colleagues with regard to the Special Olympics uh, uh, annual general meeting and awards last evening. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, I was not able to attend because of a previous commitment. But I just want to recognize the whole Special Olympics organization, which does so much to encourage health and activity here in PEI, Mr. Speaker. But uh, certainly I want to, uh, to recognize and acknowledge the athletes of the year who were uh, awarded last night, Janet Cherchuk and Keegan Waite. Janet actually comes from my district up in Albert and Bloomfield in District 26, and she has been involved in the Special Olympics for a total of 24 years, Mr. Speaker. Oh. She has represented PEI at two national games and one world games, and most recently dominated her division and took home gold at the 2022 Special Olympics Bose Open. And also, with regard to uh, Keegan, Mr. Speaker, uh, he has been a Special Olympics member for seven years in floor hockey and basketball programs, and recently learned of his selection to Team Canada's training squad for World Games in Berlin. An amazing accomplishment. So again, to Janet and Keegan, my congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Did I miss anyone? Member statement. The Honourable Member from Morrell, Dona, and the Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, we all know in this legislature the dedication and service we enjoy from our volunteer firefighters and first responders, and uh, that's no uh, uh, secret to you, Mr. Speaker, in your former history. Um, there's likely not a member in this chamber who doesn't know of a, story uh, of a story of a fire department going the extra mile during and after Fiona to protect residents, community, and property. We all owe our volunteer firefighters and first responders a debt of gratitude for their brave efforts, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with that in mind, I rise today to commend a constituent of mine, uh, one that the Assembly would be familiar with before, uh, Ann Morrison, who was a, a recent winner of the Senior Islander of the Year. 
And here she is at it again, Mr. Speaker, and recognized the selfless work of the volunteers at the fire department uh, and the volunteers that came into the fire department as a warming center during Fiona. Um, you know, regardless of the, of the damage of their own homes, uh, and they rallied to provide exceptional support. So Anne felt here's an opportunity to help back and maybe help fundraise a little bit for the fire department just because of the good work of them, uh, their spouses, their family members that all come into the warming center at that time. So $10, $20 at a time, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Anne uh, rallied the community and she raised almost $3,000 in the matter of a couple weeks uh, just to go to the, to the fire department, Mr. Speaker. It's an excellent example of how Islanders support each other in very difficult times in a small community. It's also an example of how simple acts of kindness and gratitude can go a long way sometimes, even without realizing at the time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, third party, House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Post-tropical F storm Fiona impacted every Islander. And while there are many stories of Islanders being devastated by the storm, there are many stories of kindness. One day following the storm at the West Royalty Reception Center, I was approached by a father who has a five-year-old, two-year-old, and his wife had just given birth two days earlier. As a newcomer to PEI five years ago, he has no family in PEI. His home had no power, no water, no access to any necessities required to care for his newborn and the rest of his young family. He was scared. Health PEI would not permit his wife and newborn to stay in the hospital and discharge them with nowhere to go, and his baby took its first breath in a strange new world. The Red Cross shelter was not appropriate for a family with a newborn and two children under the age of five, as they did not have set up for this situation. The Red Cross did not immediately provide a solution for this family. I tried to reassure Akut that the community would step up with his family, and step up they did. With no questions asked, Dr. Marva Sweeney Nixon her husband Graham Nixon and son stepped up to answer a desperate call by opening their home to five complete strangers facing the unknown. Through this generous act of kindness, Marva Graham ensured the family had a safe environment with warm food, entire floor for their own needs, and a lots of room to rest, catch their breath, and time to arrange their affairs. Akut later said he could finally sleep knowing his family was loved and safe. This is what the community is all about, and I want to publicly thank Mar Marva, Graham, and Ben for their deep generosity. Our island is a great place because of our, it's in our fabric to care and put others first. This is only one of thousands such acts of kindness by Islanders, but it is one I'll never forget. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Tignish, Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Due to COVID restrictions, the 2021 PEI Senior Award recipients did not have official recognition until this year. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate Aubrey Arsenault of Deblois in the great district of Tignish Palmer Road for being selected as Senior of the Year. Aubrey is an easygoing fellow who quickly makes everyone he feels comfortable with from the first moment they meet him. He has been a mentor to many, a friend to all, and an inspiration to his community. I would like to list some of the things that Aubrey has been involved in in his senior years and throughout his lifetime. He is a mentor to young fishers, he has captained many vessels and continues to do so ensuring the younger generation aboard the vessels he has captained has the skills necessary to face the sea with confidence. He has been a volunteer musician for numerous benefits in western Prince Edward Island over a span of several decades. Aubrey has performed as a volunteer in many drama club presentations in the community of Palmer Road to raise funds for the local church and the Knights of Columbus Hall, such as the dinner theatre, the Micaram uh, pageant during the Lenten season, the live nativity scene, and the Christmas play, just to name a few. He was the recipient of the Community Spirit Award in 2019 at the Tignish Fishers Awards Banquet, a member of the Palmer Road Knights of Columbus, a member of the Palmer Road Parish Auction Committee, a volunteer for the Tignish Community Member Relations Acadian Festival. He has been a volunteer Santa for the local singers' home. Aubrey has been an advocate for the Acadian culture and his mother tongue, speaking fluently in both languages. He holds his Acadian culture close to his heart and shares with youth the traditions of the Acadian people. He has mentored many local youth with bass guitar also. It was no surprise to hear his recognition for his work in areas such as volunteering, artistic achievement, leadership, mentorship, fundraising, community participation, and career achievement. 
As a friend, I proudly congratulate Aubrey and ask members of this legislature to please join me in acknowledging his being named as Senior Islander of the Year for his outstanding contributions to his community. Okay. Questions by members, starting with response to questions taken as notice. No? For a first question, I'll call an honourable leader of the official opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, during debate on a government bill, the Minister of Social Development and Housing stated clearly that the housing crisis has been caused by government and that it is government's responsibility to fix it. Our caucus could not agree with that more. And over three years ago, we put forward a paper listing the emerging problems when it came to shelter and presenting a plan with a list of actions that needed to be act on, acted on immediately in order to stave off the crisis we now find ourselves in. A question to the Premier. Your administration has sat on its hands doing almost nothing while people suffered. Why didn't your government put in place measures over three years ago that would have turned the tide on this housing crisis that we now face on Prince Edward Island? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, for three consecutive years, we have spent an incredible amount of money investing in housing, uh, knowing that there's a challenge, Mr. Speaker, with the growing population and the fact that the uh, investments hadn't been made leading up to uh, uh, really beginning 2015 uh, and, and onward, and they continue. We continue to make these investments, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think you'll hear later today that we'll make uh, the largest ever investment to try to set a goal to try to get to a point uh, where we can relieve some of the pressure within the system, Mr. Speaker, but it's, a, it's been a challenging situation. We've inherited it. We've hit it head on. Uh, we've tackled it every single day, Mr. Speaker. I'm proud of the ministers who have served in the job previously. I'm proud of the minister who's there now. His heart's in the right place. We have a target. We're going to work and do everything we can to reach that target to make it better for Islanders, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the official opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Had government invested significantly in public housing over the last three years, or perhaps the lost three years is a better description, and brought forward regulations in a variety of areas, I believe firmly that the scrambling that this government is now doing to try and rectify this mess would not be necessary, and that we would have spared islanders so much suffering. Federal programs like the Rapid Housing Initiative, which covered up to 90% of costs and allowed other jurisdictions to buy up properties and quickly turn them into housing units, were all but ignored by this government. To the Premier, you were very happy to chase federal dollars for pavement. Why didn't your government have the same kind of excitement for housing dollars create, to create affordable housing at a time when it was absolutely clear that it was desperately needed here in our island? Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, part of the job as Premier is to chase funds in all areas, Mr. Speaker, from Ottawa. I've done that. I think we have uh, probably have a, a very wonderful relationship with the current government in Ottawa, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's been pointed out in here many times by me, mostly, that uh, the federal government has put more money into Prince Edward Island in the last three years than they have any time in their history, Mr. Speaker. I think that's part of the relationship uh, that we built, Mr. Speaker. That includes housing, that includes rapid housing, that includes infrastructure, that includes all different programs, Mr. Speaker. The more we can bring into Prince Edward Island, the more we can do for Islanders, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to do that. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker. So, the problems with existing legislation related to housing are abundantly clear. We're debating essentially an emergency bill on the floor of the House currently. And the Rental of Residential Properties Act dates back to 1988. For over three years, we've been waiting for a new and more modern act to replace this piece of legislation and fix the many issues that are contained within it, in including legislating a cap on rental increases. To the Premier, had this new act been in place, your government would not be scrambling as it is now, and uh, by the way, always seems to be reacting to a crisis. How would tenants and our housing market uh, be better off today if you had indeed passed this legislation three years ago? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, if our government and, and our province has been forced to react to crisis, Mr. Speaker, it's because we've been dealt with uh, very difficult situations. Hurricane Dorian, Mr. Speaker. 
uh, COVID-19, Mr. Speaker, Hurricane Fiona, Mr. Speaker, Podeta Ward, nothing of our doing, nothing of Islanders doing, Mr. Speaker, but we've met those crises head on because we had to, Mr. Speaker. We walked through this with Islanders hand in hand. We've been at the head of it. We haven't shirked our duties, Mr. Speaker. We're working, doing everything we can, and we got this island in a pretty good place in spite of those crises, Mr. Speaker, and we're proud of that. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And there's a critical difference between the crises that the Premier just described and the housing crisis and the health care crisis and the economic crisis that Islanders are facing. And that is they were natural disasters of which you had no control, but this was a choice of your government, and that's what makes it so difficult. This is far from the first instance of a lack of planning or broken promises from this administration. Later today, of course, we're going to receive a capital budget, and all signs yet again are that we will see a big investment in, in public housing. Sorry, not a, in the, yet again. For the, for the first time, we'll see a, a big investment in public housing at last. Mm -hmm. But promises are nothing more than good intentions. And of course, we've been down this road before many times with this administration. Do you remember shovels in the ground on day one, for example? <laughs> The recurring pattern of this government has three components, an absence of vision, a failure to plan, and an inability to execute. We've seen it time and time again, whether it's in access to health care, or in being proactive during this impending housing crisis, or in stumbling when it comes to providing financial relief to Islanders. To the Premier, why should Islanders believe that your government will actually follow through this time on housing when history tells us that you likely won't? The Honourable Premier. Well, this, Mr. Speaker, let me present the other side of that. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition just said there hasn't been anything done in that regard uh, with legislation since 1988, Mr. Speaker. If I go through my history, that would take us from Giz Sr., Mr. Speaker, to Callback, to Bins, to Giz Jr., to McLaughlin, and now to me, Mr. Speaker, and we're doing it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Summerside Wilmot. <coughs> The Minister of Social Development and Housing tabled a bill to set aside a record high rent increase, and I sincerely thank the Minister for doing so. But this doesn't preclude every single one of those landlords from, from applying for an above the allowable increase through IRAC. And based on their previous order on this, it seems likely that they will approve those. A question to the Minister of Social Development and Housing. You essentially said yesterday that you know tenants can't afford it and have nowhere else to go. What advice do you have for them when the news cycle on this diet down, but those increases come anyway. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And obviously, yesterday we tabled that uh, uh, amendment to, towards the legislation to stop it at zero because we knew, uh, Mr. Speaker, that Islanders just couldn't afford it at this time. At the same time, I've been carrying uh, probably 15 to 20 calls in the last 12 hours from landlords and listening to their concerns. And this is where, Mr. Speaker, we really need to, to work with both. Uh, the RTA has, has been has been a, a problem as well. That's uh, en route to, to come this sitting, Mr. Speaker. We've been able to meet with the tenants and the landlords, and we're really hoping that everybody can work together and get through this. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have to say you didn't, the minister did not answer my question on this. Applying for an above the allowable rent increase is a very easy pathway for landlords to get this 10% increase anyway, and it's really hard to appeal it, much harder to appeal it than some members of this House would have you believe. No part of this process is in plain language. It's literally hundreds of pages long. If you're a senior or a new islander or really any ordinary person, you're going up against your landlord's lawyer and you don't have a great shot. Connor Kelly from the PEI Fight for Affordable Housing has been a blessing to people as they've been navigating this system, but his term is finished and now there's no one to help you. A question to the Minister of Social Development and housing, I'm afraid that these increases are still coming. So who should Islanders turn to for help in filling out their forms, researching and planning their appeals, and for support during the hearing? Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And obviously, this has been a concern uh, not only today but uh, but in the past, and and we have heard this uh, uh, as well, Mr. Speaker. The problem that government faces is is where do we go? Uh, I know there's been talk from the opposition that we fund uh, a body that would be able uh, to access those those supports, but at the same time, that is going against the landlord as well. And I realize that a lot of seniors don't have the ability to do that. So I certainly think it, it is a discussion. We do have to find a path forward, but at the same time. 
time, we need to make sure, however we go about it, uh, we need to treat the tenants fair as well as the landlords, Mr. Speaker. Somerset Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thinking, uh, speaking of things that we've been talking about, government has been talking about funding a vulnerable persons lawyer since their last budget, but that's still not a thing. It's yet another example of something that government has announced because it sounds good, but there's been no action on it. And in fact, I have followed up with justice ministers in May and then again in August, and neither one of you have even responded to me. So a question to the current justice minister. We need to finally see action to go along with these promises. Who will the vulnerable lawyer, vulnerable person's lawyer help? What will they help with? And when can islanders start calling them? Honourable members of Justice and Public Safety. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker and Honourable Member. Uh, the vulnerable lawyer is something that we are working on. It will be the job will be posted in December, and uh, part of the work that they will help with is uh, Canada Pension Plan entitlement, employment insurance, income assistance, landlord and tenancy matters, and restrictions of liberty matters. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Don Valley Sherbrooke. The COVID testing clinic in Slemon Park has been closed due to damage from Hurricane Fiona. This means that residents of PEI's second largest municipality, Summerside, have to drive at least 40 minutes to O'Leary to be tested. Question to the Minister of Health. When will a COVID testing clinic be open in Summerside again, and where will it be located? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And yes, it is. Uh, it uh, was another result of uh, the worst hurricane that this province has ever seen, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with regard to, uh, we are fortunate that we have two testing uh, clinics in the western part of the province, previously at Slemon Park and in O'Leary. Uh, certainly fortunate that that access is still open, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with regard to access for uh, testing in the Summerside area, I know that staff at CPHO are working hard to get this done and up and going as soon as possible, Mr. Speaker. Don Valley Sherbrooke. Mr. Speaker, we know that access to COVID testing is important for individual health, to prevent community spread, and for maintaining accurate public health data for which to make informed decisions. Minister, are you concerned that a lack of access to COVID testing in Summerside has impacted testing rates in the area? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as uh, the honourable member would know, that the rapid test kits are available at every access PEI site right across the province, Mr. Speaker. And I certainly encourage any islander who feels that they may have or does have symptoms of COVID that they do uh, make access and make utilization of a rapid test. Again, Mr. Speaker, if uh, as a result of a rapid test that it does show that it's positive, we do have clinics. We do have clinics set up. Uh, individuals can call 811 for additional information, for example, Mr. Speaker. And again, I reiterate, it's unfortunate that every islander has been impacted by Fiona. But we are moving forward. We will get this up and going as soon as possible with the great work of uh, staff at CPHO. Thank you. Valley Sherbrooke. As the minister would be well aware, um, you uh, you can only do so much if you can't get a PCR test. We know that if we don't keep track of how uh, COVID is spreading, where it is happening, uh, then we won't be able to make informed decisions and public health won't have the information it needs. And right now, there's no way to track rapid tests. You haven't uh, added that capacity. So we really are at a loss. It has been well over a month since Fiona hit and the Slemon Park testing clinic had to close. The damage to the building was severe and it was clear to just anyone, to just about anyone who saw it from day one, that repairs would be significant and time consuming. Minister, your premier seems to have been able to open a politically strategic office in Summerside very, very quickly. No problems there. Why have you failed to open at least a temporary, a temporary COVID testing clinic in Summerside? Mr. Uh, Speaker, and with regard to uh, the Premier opening an office in Summerside, I give accolades for that because he is con uh, concerned. He wants to give the uh, people of Western PEI of Summerside an opportunity to have their voice and have their voice right here. Mr. Speaker, with regard to what uh, the Honourable Member has uh, stated, we do have the access to the clinic in O'Leary. 
It is, uh, it's open. It's open there continuously, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the individual, the member speaks about data. We do collect data. It's unfortunate. You look at the, at the work that CPHO has done over the last two and a half years, and to call into question what they are doing at this point in time, I think it's, ir it's irresponsible, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, after Fiona hit, Charlottetown Mutual Aid started responding to requests to pop into public housing and check on residents. They found some in pretty bad shape. In fact, they told our standing committee they were worried they would find someone dead. They brought in blankets, food, hot meals, ice to keep medication cool, made phone calls for residents, etc. Question to the Minister for Social Development and Housing. What do you think would have happened to these islanders at, in public housing if community had not have stepped in? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'd be uh, the first to rise and thank Charlottetown Mutual Aid and, and uh, everyone at PEI that come together in, in a time of need and, and help everybody out. Uh, it was truly rewarding to, to see, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I know that there, there was lots of issues. Uh, we've all had the calls. We've seen them. Um, now is to work through them, Mr. Speaker. It's to take the issues that were uncovered, to find out where the problems are, and to make sure that we're prepared uh, the next time this does happen, because it will happen. So uh, once again, Mr. Speaker, thanks uh, to all Islanders who helped, and uh, Charlottetown Mutual Aid, thank you. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Mr. Speaker, and I'm assuming that me means that you'll be meeting with Charlottetown Mutual Aid to hear their experience. A few days after Fiona again, frost warnings were issued in Charlottetown. Temperatures dipped to below zero overnight. This was especially concerning for unhoused islanders who would have to brave the weather outdoors. Thankfully, Charlottetown Mutual Aid was able to deliver thousands of dollars worth of supplies to unhoused islanders, including warm jackets, pants, hand warmers, blankets, and more. Question to the minister. What do you think would have happened to this community had the, in the absence, had the community not stepped in in the absence of government. Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and once again, uh, we know the hard work of Islanders got everybody uh, through Fiona, Mr. Speaker. Uh, like I mentioned yesterday, that uh, I will be taking a log of uh, everything that uh, we had done uh, as well, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we're, we're just redacting some of the, the names and personal information on there, Mr. Speaker. But what I can say is, is we know what took place. We know that we need to improve the system behind it. I'm not questioning any of that, Mr. Speaker. What got us through Fiona was the hard work of of all Islanders coming together, and I'm very grateful to have had that happen. Uh, so like I say, we will certainly be sitting down. We'll see where we need to improve. We know we need to improve on some of these issues, Mr. Speaker, and we will. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Mr. Speaker, and I'm very grateful for the community too, because I honestly believe that they saved lives on this island. We're constantly told that government has case management, has a case management plan for unhoused islanders. A few weeks ago, unhoused residents at the Charlottetown events grounds had numerous possessions seized by municipal officials without any apparent lawful basis for the seizure. The event grounds are managed by CADC and who is their primary shareholder, the province. Question to the minister. If the province is not ready to house these individuals yet, what is it doing to make sure these islanders have access to heat and electricity at the event grounds until the housing units are ready? Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I think I'm safe to say, and Mr. Speaker, uh, this government has done more for the homeless population than any government in history. And we have seen that. We have seen that right now, Mr. Speaker. We've done everything we could in the. In and they're on their way. There's 51 units down there. There's 51 units down there. And we were able to do that in a matter of 90 days, more than any other government has ever done in this history of the province. So now, Mr. Speaker, now, Mr. Speaker, we're working towards the next step. We know that we got to get to 24-7 access for the homeless shelter, Mr. Speaker. We know that our homeless population is increasing. And while we're working with our NGOs, we need support. We need to continue working to improve. My department has gone to homeless shelters all across this country. We know where we need to go, and we're going to get there, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Brighton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm really pleased that the government has adopted my net zero standard in their buildings, and pleased that the province has set an aggressive goal of this province 
being net zero by 2040. Uh, best in Canada, I believe. This is presumably means that all buildings, used as well as new, will be net zero by then. Question to the Minister of Energy and Climate Change. How are you planning to make all of those buildings net zero by 2040? Well, th thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I don't intend to do it myself, for sure. Uh, we're relying on the, uh, the greater community and the construction community, and if you go around to some of the new buildings now, you see they're already all electric heat and heat pumps. They're to the highest efficiency standards. All the new houses that are going up in, in Stratford are, are at the, the top standard. We're, we're asking all the time, are they, are they installing oil? And they're not. They're installing uh, electricity. When it comes to current buildings, we do have an aggressive plan already. We'll, we're going to continue to ratchet it up to, to get people the fuel switch, which is our, our first 30 years. We have efficiency programs to help them with insulation. Many islanders will get it for free. Many, many islanders will get it for free. And then many, many more will get it for free again because we're going to continue to invest at the level we're investing in. And finally, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to government buildings, uh, there may be some information in the capital budget that deals with how we'll deal with that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Tignish, Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Inflation continues to affect Islanders every day, and our province continues to lead the country in month-over-month -month inflation. There are many external factors affecting our rising inflation that are beyond government's control. But one thing government could have done to help with inflation, aside from accurate forecasting, is to be mindful and responsible with their spending. After reviewing the most recent public accounts book, it appears the Department of Fisheries and Communities did just that, being one of the few departments that did not overspend on their budget. Question to the Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Your department actually underspent their budget. What internal policies and oversight did you implement in order to do so? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're very efficient. <laughs> The Honourable Sorry. Member from Tignes Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker. Well, also, short on words, yeah. So, <laughs> so, upon further review of the updated public accounts, I was surprised to see that the Department of Fisheries and Communities received and spent the least amount of money than any, than any other department, excluding the Executive Council, out of the COVID contingency fund. Question to the Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Why did your department spend $606,000, which is 50% less funding than the second least funded department, to support programs and initiatives through your department? The Honourable Master of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our department through community side is mostly client driven. So the intake actually from clients requesting assistance or program funding was actually down compared to other, other periods. And that's one thing about our department, we can do that. We adapt our department and our role with our programs as required by the clients and what they need. So when the client asks for something, we adapt to that, we provide the response to them, and that's how we do it. We respond to the client as what they need. Thank you very much. Tignish Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker, your second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I see this as a missed opportunity, uh, especially for our, our older adults in rural Prince Edward Island who often look to their municipalities for events and opportunities to gather and socialize. Something um, that many were deprived of for three years and were eager but anxious to get back into a safe manner. And I'm sure municipalities surely asked. Question to the Minister. Municipalities could have created or expanded programs uh, like these with funding from your department. Did you even try to advocate to your cabinet who makes the decisions for supports like this? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our department has been very aggressive in the last three years to make sure that every community, every municipality, every nonprofit group, every group out there possibly could know about our programs. We have never turned down an application by a municipality for funding through my department since we've been in power as this administration. Larry Infiness. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, last night on CBC, our big city health guru was expounding the great improvements of get that in healthcare, like getting dandruff and mild acne treatment uh, prescription at your local pharmacy. And he says that will make healthcare better. And I'll agree, I think we do need to expand our scope of practice of our pharmacists, Mr. Speaker. But uh, we, when it comes to the real serious issues in healthcare, like issues that, uh, you know, doctor and RN shortages, ER wait times, or long term care bed utilization, we have to wait for that, Mr. Speaker. So a question I always ask to the Minister of Health every year uh, Minister, 
Today on PEI, how many publicly funded long-term care designated beds are sitting empty? The Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member for the question. Of last information that I had, Mr. Speaker, which would be very recently, the end of last week, 60. Larry Inverness. Well, it's good to say I do know that there was 32 in the west or Summerside West, Mr. Speaker. The backlog of people waiting for long-term care beds has a negative systematic impacts ranging on our emergency department, overcrowding, ambulance response times, acute care availability, and even surgical procedures, Mr. Speaker. Question to the Minister of Health. How many patients are awaiting long-term care in acute care beds currently on PEI? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Mr. Speaker, that, uh, and I do thank uh, the member for the question, and uh, it's great to uh, see his uh, concern with regard to the health care system on the island. It's unfortunate that uh, that same concern wasn't shown a few years ago, but I do appreciate it. he's showing it now. Mr. Speaker, that number would vary from day to day, to be honest with you. There has been substantial movement from uh, both from the community and from our acute care facilities into long-term care, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I had indicated the number 60. Uh, that uh, here a relatively short time ago was in the 80s, Mr. Speaker. So there has been movement. Thank you. Larry Infernes, your second supplementary. And that's the issue, Mr. Speaker. They have been moving. They have been moving some people into beds, but they haven't been hiring any people. To, to deal with care for these people, Mr. Speaker, I'm getting calls from people all over Prince Edward Island that are saying their conditions are deplorable at some of the, the, the care that they're getting. Second question, Mr. Speaker, second supplementary. The goal always is to get these patients into the appropriate level of care. And uh, obviously the minister seems to be under some pressure to get these people into a bed, Mr. Speaker. But it is about appropriate staffing complements. How many long-term care facilities in staffing protocols would be considered unsafe, Mr. Speaker? And or is this just another smoke and mirrors game of putting people in beds and not providing the service? The Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, no government, I don't think in the short time that it has been in power, has taken more initiatives with regard to health human resources. You look, we've increased the seats at uh, UPEI Nursing, changes to the accelerated program, Program. Intakes, increased intakes in the LPN program, Mr. Speaker. We've increased the number of intakes in the RCW. We provided free tuition to our RCWs. Mr. Speaker, if there had been a vision from the previous administration, a plan, we wouldn't be where we're at right now. And Mr. Speaker, that's one of the reasons that we've initiated a 10-year human health, human resource plan so that we will know going ahead exactly what's needed. We will get it done on this side, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Charlottetown West Royalty. Training this summer or something. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, residents of District 14 continue to tell me every day that the repairs taking place at Allen's Creek continue to cause extreme amounts of congestion, unacceptable delays and commutes as the frustration grows with only one exit point from the area in Beach Grove area. The delay in commutes is now impacting the ability for school bus drivers to get children to school. Question to the Minister of Transportation. I sent you a letter about this in early August and I've had good communication with your department, but I'm curious how much traffic disruption mitigation planning went into the Maypoint roundabout flow issues by your department prior to work beginning? The Honorable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honorable Member. Um, our department works with the City of Charlottetown. In this case, this, is, this was their project. And in hindsight, probably more planning should have been put in place to mitigate the traffic issues there. We did have flaggers placed at the Maypoint roundabout, but the issue that we ran into is it actually backed traffic up into Cornwall for I think it was a 45-minute wait time. So we solved one issue, but we caused another. Um, we did offer a uh, temporary bridge. Um, that wasn't taken. Uh, we didn't, they didn't take us up on that offer. But I completely understand. I know that it's frustrating. Um, and unfortunately, at this time, all we can do is, is hopefully that the project is finished quickly. Charlottetown, West Warranty. 
the, I mean, the, the flagger was there for a, a day or two, and I think there was problems. But what my constituents are saying that it, it was the split times. Um, there was instead of 40, 60 or different minutes. Can it, can we look at a 90, 10 kind of split for that? Are, the people in there cannot get out. Cannot get out in the in the, in the street. So, I mean, this is a major concern. Question to the minister, Chan: Why was there why was there only one person there for an extended period of time? And will you look at putting somebody back in there to help my residents get out of where they need to get to? The honourable minister of transportation and infrastructure. We we did look at it, and we did put someone there. And as I said, we caused. By solving one issue, we caused another. And what was happening on the trans the, the highway coming into Charlottetown is it was backed up in both lanes. And with the median there, emergency vehicles weren't able to get through. So we had to make a judgment call. And what was, and I think at the end of the day, not having the flaggers there and allowing that traffic to flow in, which was backed up through all the roundabouts through Cornwall, um, was was the best decision. Now I completely understand. Do I think that? In, in the future, our department could probably work with the city before these projects happen to make sure that we can mitigate these issues 100%. Charlottetown West Royalty, your second supplementary. And I fully understand it was a, it's, a, it's a city project, but, but I did provide you this information prior to, and I did flag it, and the solution wasn't there. I mean, the communication has been great, but, but the issue is still there, so I'm not really I'm not really understanding the answer. So I think this brings up a, a bigger concern of a much larger conversation that needs to be had. Um, we, we often criticize in the South about housing and, and, and population growth, but we still have to look at, at, at different avenues or transportation issues coming into uh, the city. So question to the minister, is there a conversation being had in your department about how we can mitigate traffic coming into the capital area in the future? The Honourable Minister of Transportation Infrastructure. Uh, yes, there is, Honourable Member. So there is a number of corridors. We just did East Royalty. Uh, that finished up last year. Um, and, but you also have Lower Malpec Road. Um, and then it also going in through the member from uh, Winslow, uh, that area coming in, and from Cornwall as well. That intersection there is... So we do it. The department does have plans. Actually, we met with... Uh, uh, engineering companies on those major intersections coming in to try and fix those because our population is going up and I think you'll see over the next couple of years those plans uh, come through, through uh, we're going to get fix these intersections to help the traffic flow into the city and out of the city. The Honourable Member from Morrell, Dona. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, registered massage therapy is a profession experiencing growing demand in the labor market here in PEI as in other provinces. I have met with some in the industry over the past number of years, Mr. Speaker. In recognition of this growing reality, in 2019, uh, PEI became the fifth province to designate massage therapy as a regulated health care service. Um, question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. Do you recognize the increasing demand for registered massage therapists and the role they play in our health care system? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very uh, much, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the Honourable Member uh, for the question. Uh, do I recognize uh, the importance uh, of the role that they do play and that they can continue to play and uh, uh, to provide services, to provide medical services to the people of Prince Edward Island? Absolutely, Mr. Speaker. Merrill Dona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Exactly. They're an important part of our, our full scope of health care in, in Prince Edward Island and, and a solution. Uh, I understand the current ratio of RMTs uh, per capita in PEI is 1 to 2,700, while in New Brunswick it sits at 1 to 890 and 1 to 700 in Nova Scotia. Currently, PEI is the only Canadian province without a massage therapy program. Uh, question to the Minister. I know uh, some of the private owners have explored the development of an in-province massage therapy program with our post-secondary partners here in PEI. Is this something the government is willing to help with? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and again, uh, thank uh, the member for the question. As recently as, uh, as uh, a letter dated October 17th, I was reached out to by a massage therapy clinic, giving the background, giving uh, uh, basically the information, the statistics that the honourable member has brought forward. And, Mr. Speaker, yes, there are discussions going on with one of our post-secondary institutions with regard to training 
uh, we do have to work certainly to bring that ratio down without a doubt and we have to make use of our partners in the education system to be able to do that Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Morel Dawn, your second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Like in many other uh, education institutes, uh, when you have the education here, uh, that's what helps uh, recruit. So Islanders now seeking to train uh, to work in this field have to attend schools at a province. And like with many other professions, as I said, if you have students going off island to train, you're instantly making it harder to recruit and retain. Our uh, uh, clinics here in PEI are having to go away to try and recruit back. I've heard that uh, local practices are struggling to fill the current demand uh, by a lot. Some have offered incentives like tuition reimbursement and relocation support. Some have gone as far as to recruit internationally for RMTs through federal labor market programs, so clearly there appears to be a growing need and an opportunity to train regulated health professionals right here at home. Uh, final question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. What can the province do to assist or encourage the creation of a massage therapy program on PEI through uh, post-secondary partners or as an industry-led private school. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And the Honourable Member does raise an extremely valid point with regard if we do provide training here in the province of <coughs> Prince Edward Island, that the likelihood of those individuals taking the core super program, the likelihood of them remaining here in the province is much greater. Certainly that's one of the reasons that we have uh, increased the number of paramedicine seats at UPEI that are designated for Islanders, Mr. Speaker. But back uh, to uh, the member's question, absolutely. I will, we will work with our educational partners with uh, the industry, with massage therapists, to make sure that we can get a program in place that works for Islanders and works for those that are taking the program. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the past couple of months, we've heard some positive um, announcements regarding the healthcare system, such as the new patient transfer units for to free up ambulances and the primary access care clinics for Islanders that do not have family physicians to access care. In an interview with CBC last night, the CEO of Health PEI stated that the healthcare system will start to feel different in a very positive way. And that's a big statement. So question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. How will you determine the tax, that the taxpayer dollars spent on these programs are having the intended impact? The Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And that is an extremely uh, broad question, but I do uh, appreciate uh, the member posing it. Uh, when you say, how do you anticipate or how do you uh, uh, determine if a dollar is being spent or having a positive impact. You look at dollars that are spent, for example, Mr. Speaker, with regard to training. You look at dollars that are spent with regard to uh, uh, items that will be brought forward later this afternoon in the capital budget. It is very broad. But having said that, Mr. Speaker, our government has and will continue to invest heavily in health care. We have to be uh, nimble. We have to make changes, absolutely. But there are some very positive things happening. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Romain Stratford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I have to say I'm so disappointed with that answer because it was actually a really one good one for you to answer because then you would define what you are going to measure because what outcomes are you expecting from this program? You define the outcomes and then you set the measurements that you're going to track in order to decide whether you're hitting your intended outcomes. This is just an example of a province of, of government that doesn't know how to plan anything and let alone plan, you don't know how to track it. Question to the Minister, how are you holding Health PI accountable to ensure that the changes can be backed up by actual facts and data if you're not even setting potential outcomes of a program? Good Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to be able to uh, respond to that. You look at the initiatives we have undertaken, and it's not about figures, Mr. Speaker. It's about Islanders. It's about, yes, it is about Islanders, Mr. Speaker, and providing the services that they need. It's, uh, yes, we have to have data. We have to track without a doubt. I agree with that, Mr. Speaker. But yes, you look at some of the initiatives that I had stated earlier this afternoon that we have put in place, will continue to put in place, continue to invest in to provide services 
for Islanders in an overall health care, health human resource crisis that we see right across the country, Mr. Speaker. But we will continue to do the best that we can for Islanders each and every day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So this is the crux of the problem with our health care system because, you know, an outcome. How many Islanders have you helped with this program? That would be an outcome. In order to determine the outcome, you would define what you're going to track in order to know have you reached what your potential outcome was. The minister's feelings are not facts here and like this is so uh, this is so concerning because the minister feels like if you put a program in place it's just going to work but it's not if you don't set the system behind you. Under this government and its lack of planning, we've seen the patient registry balloon. We've seen ER wait times exceeding what every national standard would be. And we see people with mental health crises spending way too much time in the ERs. Question to the Premier. Yesterday you were talking all about facts. Where are the facts and the proof that you haven't just played a huge part in uh, that you haven't just played a huge part in crippling our healthcare system by not tracking or producing any outcomes. Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, in the almost two weeks or so since we introduced the Pharmacy Plus program, Mr. Speaker, we've helped about 25,000 Islanders. Mr. Speaker, I think those facts speak for themselves. Summerside South Drive. Final question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Debates when our open and transparent Premier told me that a citizens' assembly was going to be funded within the existing budget, he must have been forecasting the major surplus we see now. Surely it wasn't just a story told to placate those who want to see our democratic system improved. Surely the Premier isn't having second guesses now that the flawed first past the post system may help him politically. Surely not. Question to the Premier. Will you be honouring the vote of this legislature, as well as keeping your word, by striking a citizens' assembly for proportional representation before the next election? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, like the member from Summerside South Drive who was also elected under this flawed system, Mr. <laughs> Speaker, uh, I think that, uh, as I've said many times, when you look around this legislature, I think we've got a pretty good mix, Mr. Speaker, elected by the people of Prince Edward Island who pay attention, Mr. Speaker, who understand good representation, Mr. Speaker, and who want to see themselves reflected inside the legislature, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think that the Islanders do a pretty good job of this. Uh, I take everything that, uh, that takes place in this legislature very, very seriously, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, but I suppose in my defense, Mr. Speaker, we've been dealing with a lot of heavy stuff here the last number of months, Mr. Speaker. Okay, moving on to statements by ministers. Presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents. Don't have one. No statements. No statements. No. Yeah, we got table on table of documents. No. Yeah. The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I present here with a message from His Honour, the Honourable James Gormley, Administrator for the Province of Prince Edward Island, which said message is signed by the Administrator. Honourable members, I'll ask the clerk to read the message, and I'll ask everyone to stand while he reads his message. Dear Mr. Speaker, His Honour, the Honourable James Gormley, Administrator of the Province of Prince Edward Island, hereby transmits the estimates of capital revenue and capital expenditure required to carry on the public services of the province for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2024, and also until the passage of the capital estimates for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2025. In accordance with the provisions of the Constitution Act 1867 and the Prince Edward Island Terms of Union 1873, His Honour recommends the same to the Legislative Assembly. <coughs> the Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, by command of His Honour, I present herewith the estimates of capital revenue and capital expenditure required to carry on the public services of the province for the fiscal year ending 31st March 2024 and also until the passage of the capital estimates for the fiscal year March 23rd 2025. 
I move, seconded by the Honorable Minister of Finance, that the estimates be now received and do lie on the table. Mr. Carey. The Honorable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the Honorable Minister of Finance, that consideration of the estimates of capital revenue and capital expenditure in Committee of the Whole House be added to the orders of the day until such time as they are dispatched. Shall I carry? The Honorable Minister of Finance. Good afternoon. Bonjour. Quay. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to share the planned capital spending by the Government of Prince Edward Island for the 2023-2024 budgetary year. This Assembly hears about the capital budget every year, but as Minister of Finance, this is my first time introducing the capital budget. In fact, it's been just over 100 days since I assumed this role. And Mr. Speaker, it's been a busy 100 days to say the least. It is a lot of responsibility, but it's also an opportunity to help shape our province's future. C'est une grande responsabilité, mais c'est aussi une opportunité de façonner l'avenir de la province. I would like to thank Minister Compton for her time in this role. Her guidance and support over the last three months has been appreciated. I would also like to thank the team in the Department of Finance that assisted me through this transition, and a special thank you to my caucus colleagues for their support. The last few weeks have been challenging for our province. Hurricane Fiona was a direct hit to our province's infrastructure, our economy, our communities, and our people. And we should not be surprised at this. Climate change is real and is impacting our province now. It is bringing more extreme weather to our shores. It's changing our seasons and our coastlines. It is undeniable. Hurricane Fiona was the largest storm in this country's history. It was the first time since the invention of electricity that any province has completely lost power like we did from tip to tip. It had an unprecedented impact on our people, our landscape, and our environment. The cost of this storm for our province alone is closing in on a half a billion dollars. Never before has any natural disaster even come close to this price tag in PEI's history. This province and this government has faced a lot in the last three and a half years. Hurricane Dorian, rail blockades, mal malware attacks, Joy. and an abrupt halt to the export of our world-class potatoes. Islanders are also facing the largest cost of living increases in over 40 years and the immeasurable toll of the COVID-19 pandemic. It would be easy to feel defeated, and if you're feeling that way, that's okay. We have all felt that at one point or another over the last few years. But as we take the toll of our losses, we know the time has come to dust ourselves off and continue to move forward. Mr. Speaker, as a government, we will say yes to the challenge of fixing what has been lost and broken. We will say yes to rebuilding our infrastructure, our education system, and our health care facilities. We will say yes to tackling our housing crisis. We will say yes to ensuring our economy helps thrive in unpredictable times. And we will say yes to learning from past responses so we can do better in the future. Take climate change, for example. Just recently, the Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action released the province's first cl climate adaptation plan. Adaptation refers to the actions we implement now to respond to the impacts of climate change that are already happening. The problem is global, it's devastating, and it's far-reaching. But we say yes to protecting our island communities from the impacts of climate change. We don't shy away, we don't run and hide, we roll up our sleeves and get to work. And Mr. Speaker, when it comes to this budget, this is exactly what we're going to do. This isn't a time to shrug our shoulders. This is a time for bold and decisive leadership. And Mr. Speaker, the budget I present to this House today is both bold and decisive. It's time to invest in health care infrastructure that meets the needs of Islanders. Over the last number of weeks, our government has been talking about health care a lot. Health care is the single most important issue that successive governments over decades have tried to wrap their arms around. La santé en jeu le plus important que les gouvernements qui se sont succédés au fil de ces années ont toujours tenté de régler une fois pour toutes. Our government has been candid with Islanders. The current system isn't working. It can't be fixed. So, Mr. Speaker, we are building a new system. A system that focuses on who we have and not who we hope to get a system that focuses on collaboration and using our professionals to the full scope of their practice. 
a system that puts the focus on the patient. These changes, changes aren't easy. It's an evolution, not a revolution. But we are committed to making the innovative changes that so desperately needed in order to provide better access to care across the province. We know that infrastructure and technology will be necessary to make the new system, system successful. We continue to build medical homes and medical neighborhoods to improve access to care. This budget has an investment of $58 million for primary care infrastructure across the province. This includes $3 million to finish the new Alberton Community Health Centre, $22 million for the new Summerside Community Health Centre, and $9 million for the East Community Health Centre. There is also $21 million for the new Queens County Health Centre, which will be co-located with the Mental Health Campus, and $3 million to complete leasehold improvements for the Community Health Centre at the Mount. These centers will bring together allied health professionals to pro provide wraparound services to Islanders by working together collaboratively under one roof. The new mental health campus is one of the largest capital investments in our province's history, second only to the construction of the Confederation Bridge in the 90s. Since last fall, we have seen the new Lacey House and our structured housing open. Construction is underway for the new emergency department short stay unit, and we continue to push forward on the next steps of this project. There will be $174.4 million invested over five years in our mental health campus, including social safety housing, day programs, as well as mental health and addictions, acute care hospital, and more. Mr. Speaker, perhaps one of the best investments this government has made in terms of health care to date is the UPI School of Medicine. Instead of solely relying on recruiting doctors from around the world to come to PEI, we're building a medical school right here in PEI. We're going to train physicians here and keep them here. In order to prepare our medical system for these students, we need to make one of the largest investments in our province's history to update our community hospitals. This budget commits $22.8 million to begin to build a new hospital in Kings County, in addition to $18.5 million over five years for capital repairs to other health facilities across the province. And while the physical space for health care is important, the necessary technology and equipment to provide seamless integration with our existing systems is just as important. This budget includes $11 million over five years to invest in our hospital information systems, mental health and addiction electronic medical records, and expand access of the EMR to community pharmacies to support the new Pharmacy Plus PEI program. This is the largest investment ever made in health infrastructure in our province's history, and it's what's needed to transform our health care to ensure that it's reliable and accessible for all Islanders now and into the future. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to a forward-thinking education system. Hurricane Fiona didn't spare our schools. Some were hit harder than others, and we know our schools are important places for our children to learn, to grow, and to gain skills that will shape them for the future. Mr. Speaker, we aren't shying away from making the investments that are needed in our schools. What we are saying is yes to preparing our island youth to rise to the challenges they will face in the future. This budget includes the largest investment in our province's history, $128 million, for no new builds, expansions, and capital improvements. That includes $24 million for the first net zero school in Atlantic Canada, Sherwood Elementary. That, that also includes $52 million for a new high school in Stratford. Cela comprend $41 million de dollars pour une nouvelle école à Evangeline. Cela comprend 12 millions de dollars pour l'agrandissement de l'école François Bouillot. And Mr. Speaker, we ain't, we're not delaying on any of these projects. The work on these schools starts today. There will be 20 million over five years in major school repairs at a variety of schools across the island, and an additional 14 million specifically for Georgetown, Elliott River, Montague Consolidated, Consolidated, along with ventilation upgrades at our remaining island schools. This is a $9 million increase over capital repairs budget of last year to assist schools in addressing the need for improved efficiency in our school infrastructure. To continue our work towards being the first province to be net zero, we have allocated $51.3 million over five years for school buses, an inc increase of $10.9 million over last year. 
the largest investment to date to speed up the transition of our school bus fleet to zero emission vehicles. This equates to 125 new electric school buses and charging infrastructure with each electric bus saving nearly 18 tons of CO2. Our plan is to have the entire school bus fleet electrified by 2030. Mr. Speaker, this budget also includes almost $11 million for classroom technology, such as computers, Chromebooks, smart boards, and upgrades to trades training equipment at Isle Intermediate and High Schools. Mr. Speaker, we are taking bold action to fix the housing crisis. The shortage of housing in this province is a real issue. We continue to hear this loud and clear from communities large and small, rural and urban. As a government, we're committed to solving this problem once and for all. Since 2019, our government has made record investments in housing through growing our inventory of public housing, but also with partnering with private developers. The Minister of Social Development and Housing has a plan. That plan is comprehensive, well thought out, and will get us back to a healthy vacancy rate of 4%. Government must lead this work, and Islanders deserve results. The first step in increasing our investment is in growing our inventory of public housing. We will do this by using a multi-pronged approach with new builds, modular units, and purchasing new and existing inventory. With $150.9 million over five years, our plan builds on existing commitments that include 100 new units in the fall 2021 budget and adds 365 new publicly owned social and affordable units. bringing our total to more than 450 units in this new five-year five, five plan. Wow. This includes 140 units on Malpec Road, 60 units in Hillsborough Park, 30 units in Montague, 31 units in Summerside, 150 modular and purchase units across the province in rural communities, and the work on these units starts today. We will also work with partners such as the Construction Association of PEI and the Industrial Arts Program at Public Schools Branch to provide 34 small homes to communities across the province. Yeah. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, we know our existing inventory needs investment as well. That's why we are committing $20 million over five years on renovations, greening, retrofitting, and ensuring every senior's unit has backup generator emergency power. Mr. Speaker, last year's five-year capital budget for housing was projected to be $67 million. Today, I stand here shoulder to shoulder with Minister McKay and my colleagues, and I'm proud to say the new five-year plan is $196 million. Mr. Speaker, that's almost triple the plan from last year. We aren't shying away. We're going to tackle the housing crisis head on. Mr. Speaker, we are also growing our public infrastructure. To keep our communities connected and keep the traveling public safe, we are investing over $240 million over five years in highways, highways, paving and bridges. We continue to invest in sustainable transportation with $3.5 million in public electric vehicle charging stations over two years and $5.5 million in active transportation trails. To help reach our goal of protecting 7% of our land, we are also allocating $1.8 million over five years to purchase land that will support the conservation of natural habitat. Through our investment in buffer zone protection, we are committing $2.5 million to protect our water courses. Mr. Speaker, we are also investing $10 million over five years in the protection of our shoreline and coastal roads and bridges. We are investing $30 million in provincial buildings over five years. Included in this amount is $10 million in new funding to support greening and retrofitting public buildings, including on schools, with a goal of reducing GHG emissions to help us meet our net zero goals. From public safety to our justice system, we are making investments to increase the safety of our province. This includes in continuing our investment in the 911 system upgrades and the provincial integrated communication system. There are also new investments in the emergency measures organization to help them in responding to future emergencies. We will also invest 
in government emergency preparedness with $7.5 million over three years to place generators at key infrastructure sites like Access PEI, Justice facilities, and for our electric school bus fleet, while also addressing other needs identified following Hurricane Fiona. We also have a responsibility to ensure that those in the correction system are being treated fairly and they are housed safely. This includes continued improvements to the Provincial Correctional Centre as well as new investments in security and ventilation upgrades. Additionally, in response to community groups and stakeholders, we have committed $3 million to develop a site where vulnerable islanders can access all the services they need, including shelter, day programming, counseling, therapy, and other services identified and needed by these individuals and the community organizations that work with them on a daily basis. Mr. Speaker, in conclusion, this is a record high capital budget for our province. For the first time in our history, this five-year plan will exceed $1 billion. It is the largest investment ever made in our infrastructure. Our government has said yes to securing the future of health care, education, housing, safety, public lands and roads. We say yes to meeting the needs of Islanders now and for many years to come. Mr. Speaker, I will conclude by saying never in the history of the province has a government had to deal with so much, but also never has a government been able to do so much. We are proud of the investments we've made in the last three and a half years, and we are proud of the plan that we lay out here today for our province for the next five years. I look forward to the debate on this capital budget with my legislative colleagues. Thank you. Merci. Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to take a moment to first thank the many civil servants in the Department of Finance and across government who have worked hard over the past weeks and months to develop this budget. It's an unenviable task to have to make a fiscal plan for a faint hearted government party with no vision, little compassion, and a complete inability to make the changes that islanders need. Mr. Speaker, provincial budgets are aspirational documents. They tell a story. They tell a story about what the government of the day sees as its vision for the province. Unfortunately, those stories often amount to little more than words. It's okay. Thank you. It means I can lean on it. <laughs> this story asks us to find the real test of leadership. The test of leadership is whether these aspirations are followed up by action. And that's a test that this Premier and his government have utterly failed. We hope that all the initiatives in this latest budget don't have to be announced, re-announced, re-announced again, re-announced again and again, like the new Sherwood School was before work finally started on it this year, or like the dental program, or like midwifery, or the new mental health hospital. Sadly, unless it's something that this government can throw money at using a surprise surplus that they magically find every year, the need is left unmet and islanders are abandoned, Mr. Speaker. It seems if you have to actually plan for it or do some hard work, forget it. It's beyond their ability. Not to mention there's probably no political points to be scored. And let's be clear, most of the promises made in this budget won't even break ground before the next election. these promises in today's budget will be ignored or forgotten. Given the, spotty record over the, given the spotty record over the term of this government, it's a fair question that islanders deserve to know the answer to. Let's talk about budget promises. One would think that if you're actually putting money in the budget for some program or project, it would be a sure thing. But over and over, this government has proven it is not. When government asked for our input into this budget, our feedback was quite simple. Why don't you do what you've already promised you would and you haven't done yet? was full of all sorts of initiatives that this government has promised and failed to deliver. They have not made substantial progress on the construction of the mental health campus, especially the Hillsborough Hospital for replacement. 
adding air conditioning units for all patient areas and rooms at the Hillsborough Hospital, replacing the Summerside Harborside Medical Centre building, repairing or replacing Kings County Memorial Hospital, beginning the construction of the new school in Stratford, improving ventilation in island schools, especially for those without mechanical ventilation. This is just a short list. It's pages long. So what are our thoughts about this current budget, this 2023-2024 capital budget? No surprise, paving is number one spending priority for this government. This budget plans to spend $240 million in the next five years on highways and bridges. And on top of that, this government has consistently underestimated and overspent in this area. Special warrants for paving are pretty much as predictable as a spring thaw. Compare this to the next big ticket item, mental health, which is an area that this government consistently underspends. Here they are saying they'll spend 174 million over five years. That's 65 million less than the entire paving commitment. Or how about the third big ticket item, housing? It's another area where this government cannot seem to manage to spend the full amount budgeted year after year. For housing, an area this government has just now finally admitted is a crisis of its own making, government is only willing to commit $161 million over five years. That's $80 million less than it would spend on highways and pavement. We do not have a paving crisis. We have a housing crisis. Highway spending stays more or less constant over the next five years. We're happy making that commitment long term. Housing is spending is going to fall off a cliff in the next few years. We need stable and consistent long term investment into housing if we want to have a meaningful impact on our island housing market. 31 new units in Summerside? Are you kidding? people who are going to be homeless in Summerside in two weeks. That's almost the entire commitment that you're thinking is exciting for Summerside. It's not. We need hundreds and thousands of units, not 31. Yes. The only reason we need to have such a big spend on housing in this budget is because governments, not just this one, but previous ones as well, will give you that. You have failed for years to invest in housing. Don't pat yourselves on the back, neither side. This is only starting to make up. Only now, now beginning to make up for years of outright negligence, Mr. Speaker. This negligence has cost Islanders dearly. It's not just cost them economically, it's cost their health and their well-being. And looking at the timidness of this budget, it will continue to cost them and us dearly for years to come. Mr. Speaker, after all, this is the government that left Clifford Lee, the housing hub czar, in charge of development for almost a year after they were elected. And we don't know to this day what he did, if anything, for that six-figure salary. This is the government that didn't even bother to apply for the Federal Rapid Housing Initiative that offered 90 per cent federal funding for essential local housing projects, and we didn't put an application in. This is the government that has invested in new student housing, but is totally OK with leaving it empty until next fall so they can provide a accommodations for two weeks for the Canada Games. This is the government that has actively contributed to the housing crisis by failing to act on short-term rental regulation, failing to act on a rental registry, failing to act on essential repairs and maintenance on the properties they own and they run, failing to act on the critical need for emergency shelters and transitional housing, failing to act on homelessness, simply and completely failing to act. been years of inaction on housing, Mr. Speaker, predating this administration, but yesterday we heard for the first time government admitting that we, what we have known and said out loud for years, that an aggressive population growth strategy without an associated plan for housing, health care and education is a recipe for disaster. The time to act was 5, 10, 15 years ago, but the second best option is now. To quote C.S. Lewis, if you are on the wrong road, Progress means doing an about turn and walking back to the right road. And in that case, the one who turns back soonest is the most progressive. I guess we may have finally found that person in this government's caucus. It's a shame about the rest of them. This government has consistently underspent the budgeted amount for housing in most of its last fiscal years, and today's capital budget forecasts an underspend yet again on housing construction for 2022-23. 
Mr. Speaker, with an ageing workforce, we risk not having enough skilled tradespeople to meet the need for more housing. And we're worried that government has not treated this labour shortage challenge with the attention it deserves. But that means that government has a story ready to go when they fail to meet the targeted new housing builds. But this is not just an accept this is not an acceptable excuse, Mr. Speaker. There are plenty of creative ways to address housing shortages without the limited scope of traditional box building. What could that look like, Mr. Speaker? It's not rocket science. It could include investment in the capital budget for existing housing acquisition, which would open up access to federal funding programs that we have not yet tapped. This government can and should be leveraging federal funding programs and the housing corporation assets. We own 1,600 housing units, Mr. Speaker. We can leverage those and the value that they had contain to buy existing multi-unit commercial properties like the Causeway Bay Motel, to convert commercial space to residential, to invest in modular homes, prefab homes and tiny homes and the associated regulatory changes that they require, and to purchase existing rental properties as they come on the market. The Minister of Social Development and Housing said just yesterday that we need 1,400 units a year just to begin to address the housing shortfall in the province. And honestly, Mr. Speaker, I think that's an underestimate because we're already so far behind. It is critical that this government expand its inventory of public housing from its current 1,600 units. As it stands, this failure to think creatively means that your co commitment, this government's commitment of 465 new public housing builds over five years, while historic, is less than 100 units a year. How is that going to help, Mr. Speaker? It, every person that gets a home is going to value that home, but Mr. Speaker, that's the entirety of our waiting list right now. Mr. Speaker, regarding health care, how could we forget the inf infamous shovels in the ground on day one that the Premier promised for our mental health hospital? Unfortunately, the trend of announcing key health initiatives with zero follow-through has become a trend with this government. For the fifth straight year in a row, we have millions invested in mental health capital. It's remarkable that this government will head into the next election, having failed to deliver on its central campaign promise from 2019. Well, two promises if you count carbon pricing. Year over year, this government has failed Islanders by failing to deliver on these critical health projects. Government says that health care is a top priority, but let's be clear, when your actions fall short for Islanders struggling every day to get care, and for health care workers feeling burnt out and disrespected while keeping the system together, it's little more than another story. We do not underspend on pavement or fail to complete road projects, Mr. Speaker. If health care was a priority for this government, the promised health clinics and hospital upgrades would be up and running by now. If health and wellness was a priority for this government, then they would have learned from COVID and invested into our long-term care infrastructure already. There's money in this budget for construction and renovations to clinics and hospitals across the island, but these are largely the same promises that were made in last year's budget and the year before. I'll believe it when I see it, Mr. Speaker, and so will the thousands of Islanders who have no family doctor and nowhere to turn for their day-to-day -day health care needs. Mr. Speaker, we are way past the point of needing major investment in climate change, both to reduce emissions and to pre prepare for the changes that are now inevitable. Yet this government continues to rely only on words and tinkering around the edges. We have yet to see a commitment to the transformative change that we know must come. Emergency preparedness is more than generators at fire halls. Welcome as they are, we should be providing money to retrofit community centres to be fully accessible. Fully accessible emergency warming shelters with generators or solar panels with battery storage, washrooms, shower facilities, kitchens. We are going to need them sooner than we want. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, what would our priorities be? Paving is great to have. We need to get from A to B. I mean, we need those roads, but a responsible government will be providing for people's basic needs first. That's what it means to be about people. Everybody needs shelter to survive. It is a human right that far too many people in PEI are struggling with. So housing must be a top priority, and 465 units doesn't cut it. You should be spending more on housing than paving. Healthcare is critical to the well-being of Islanders. You should be spending more on healthcare 
than paving. <laughs> Building and preparing for the new and evolving climate reality also needs to be a high priority. We're starting to see some baby steps in this direction, but given that we're decades behind where we need to be, this isn't enough. We should be spending more on adapting to climate change than paving. Our economy succeeds when people are safe, healthy, and housed. We need more than a story. We need action. Instead, all we're getting is another tall tale from this tired Tory government. Honourable member from Charlottetown West Royalty and third party House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you, uh, uh, Minister, for delivering that budget. And I, I can't help but, but as listening to that, feel emotional because that's the way my constituents are feeling. They're feeling emotional, they're scared, they're tired. They've been in a long-term fight against inflation for the last two years. And that's the way I'm looking at this budget, through the lens of the people that I represent, the working class that is moving into poverty. And this budget does not do anything for them. I'm worried. We say things in that, in that presentation. We're tackling housing. We're the only government that's tackling housing. Well, for three years, you did nothing. For three years, you didn't meet your own targets. For three years, you did not follow the housing action plan that was there. We don't run and hide. But you didn't listen. You didn't listen to Islanders. They needed you. But instead, there's an $83 million surplus when Islanders are struggling the most in their lives. They needed the assistance. They needed this budget to be there. Although there is some good things in this budget. There's some good directional things. The problem is for three years they weren't there. Capital repairs, $3.6 million. I applaud that. They're much needed. And I think on this side of the House, both uh, the official opposition and us, we have been working on this to repair the buildings because we're in the facilities. We know what's there. And this is, a, this is good news, but do we have the people to do it? These, these repairs need to be done now. They need to be done quickly. They can't be done in five years. The time is now to repair our existing stock and add to it. Volume is an in incredibly important word for the Minister of Housing. We need more housing. So when you come last year, when you come in with 100 new units, and then I find out that 54 of them have been done in a combination of buying and building. And an administrator said, it's getting, the strategy is taking too long just to, just to build. So the, and now you're adding another 365 units onto that. We need to find a way to fix that strategy. We need to find a way the provincial government needs to build housing and low-income housing for Islanders. That needs to be paramount. And that's going to be a massive challenge. It's not just about buying stock. We need to add to it. There's a lot of good things in this, in this budget announcement. And I just want to say, Ecole Evangeline, Say, say, un grand succès. Merci beaucoup. C'est très, très important pour le passage dans la région. C'est une difficile situation après Fiona, mais ils, ils ont besoin de cet cet uh, cet cet important investissement. Primary health care. Is, is getting investments, but what I'm hearing is that people need access. 25,000 people, and I think it's a low number on the patient registry. They don't care if they're getting service in a shoebox. They need access to health care. So, Minister, you, you need to do more to provide them more, because that's what I'm hearing. That's what, I'm, that's what they need. And the medical homes, I'm not sure they're taking people off the patient registry, but they're always asking me, and I need that to happen. We need that to happen together. The mental health facility, again, you, you did say shovels were in the ground, and I know it's a communication thing early on, but the communication after three years and the, and the jokes around that are getting old. That needs to be done because our mental health systems 
in complete chaos at the moment. And Islanders need it. After COVID, Fiona, uh, everything that they face, they need that support there. So expedite the process, expedite what's happening, because Islanders do need that. I look at this, and the minister said this is an evolution, not a revolution. We do need a revolution right now, because we sat around for far too long not doing enough. So change that. It does need to be a revolution. We need more because Islanders are hurting. They don't have a place to live, and they need supports. People not far from here have formed a community that needs supports. They need our assistance. They need our help. And I'm not sure why, in our, in our submission to this government, we ask for transitional housing units. It's right here. But yet we find we get shelter units for people who have built a community. It's not going to work. They need transitional housing, Minister. I will give the Minister compliments to that. There's, there's things being done. There's things being done, and, and, and this is something that we need to work on together. And I appreciate our conversations, but it's, it's the model. It's the model that we have to get right. I look at this and I, I, I applaud the investments into EMO, but I'm very skeptical because in my area is Beach Grove Home. And upon talking to the staff, you realize that we approved a generator, a massive generator for Beach Grove Home in this capital budget two years ago. You didn't get that? It didn't get there, it didn't get installed, and so, so I'm talking with people, and they're saying, where's the generator? Our diesel one, our 20-year-old diesel one didn't work during Fiona, but it was purchased by this house. So it's got to be better, and I understand right now, we weren't prepared, and those type of things need to be prepared, because this is information that's coming. We can't leave our long-term care facilities like that. They need those investments. Our seniors' housing need those investments. It's got to be done now. I, I, I just want to say in closing, I'm emotional because the people that I talk to are emotional. And they're hurting. They're hurting. So get busy spending this money for Islanders because it needs to be done. And this, is, this cannot be anything set up for the future next year. This money has to be spent before anything happens because they're hurting and it's their money and they need it now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, moving on. Reports by committees. Introduction of government bills. Motions other than government. Orders, oh. Mermaid Stratford and the opposition house leader. Mr. Speaker, I ask that motion 120 be now read. Sean Carey. Carey. Motion 120. The leader of the official opposition moves, seconded by the member for Summerside Wilmot, the following motion. Whereas many islanders experienced significant hardship in the wake of post-tropical storm Fiona, including damage to their homes and properties, food spoilage, long periods without electricity, unacceptable delays in delivery of financial relief, and unreliable telecommunications. And whereas the response from this government and its partners has been disorganized, poorly planned, unreasonably slow, confusing, poorly communicated, and ultimately has left out many of the islanders who most needed support. And whereas many pre-existing issues faced by Islanders were exacerbated by Fiona because they have not been adequately addressed by this and previous governments. And whereas this government failed to address many of the lessons learned from post-tropical storm Dorian. And whereas as a result of climate change, tropical storms that hit Prince Edward Island will continue to increase in both intensity and frequency. Therefore, be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly condemn government for its failure to effectively plan for and respond to the impacts of post-tropical storm Fiona. 
Therefore, be it further resolved, the Legislative Assembly urged government to immediately initiate a public inquiry into the response to post-tropical storm Fiona so that a full accounting of its actions can be heard and lessons learned in preparation for future storms. Okay, we'll ask the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition to start debate. I would be delighted to. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to stand today and to speak to this motion. And I think I'll start off by referencing... Oh, Mr. Speaker, can I recognize a couple of folks in the gallery? Sure you can. Thank you. I see Paul, Pauline Howard is back here, and I believe you were here yesterday, Pauline. Lovely to see you. And also Bethany Colquitt-McNabb, who's here for her first time this sitting. No doubt not the last. Good to see you. Uh, it's a pleasure to rise to speak to this motion, and I want to start by uh, making a connection with the discussion we've just had on the capital budget. Now, of course, naturally part of the capital budget relates to the, de the Department of Environment, Energy and Climate Change, and we're talking about the impacts of Fiona. So there's a, there's a direct relationship there in terms of the budgetary, uh, how much money is, is being budgeted for that department. And my, my colleague in her address to the capital budget made reference to the, the small amount in that particular department and the fact that we underspend regularly in many departments, and that would be one of those departments. So there's a, there's a connection there, but more the stronger connection that I want to bring forward is how what we see as a failure of this government to make priorities, to have a vision, to create a plan, and to execute that plan. Failure in all three of those areas is present both in the capital budget which came forward this afternoon. As my honorable colleague mentioned, a real lack of vision, a, a lack of awareness, a lack of acknowledgement of the real issues that are fa facing islanders today. F issues in cost of living, issues in housing primarily, and issues in accessing basic services, particularly health care. All of these are pressing issues for thousands and thousands and thousands of islanders. And a responsive, bold, visionary government would have reflected those needs in its budget. I just did not see that today. Moving to the motion, which is talking about government's response to Fiona, I think there are some very clear parallels here. The issues when it comes to responding to a crisis like this, and as we all know, this is not the only time this has happened. It's far from an isolated incident, and it certainly will not be the last time that we're faced with an extreme weather event which impacts the lives of every single islanders. There are two main components to this. One is the level of preparedness before the event happens. And the second, is, and the second aspect of it is the quality and the immediacy and the cohere, cohesiveness of the response which comes afterwards. And I would say in both of those cases, this government failed spectacularly. Wouldn't it be nice thinking to Fiona, you know, when, when governments are dealing with a situation like that, you know, an emergency really stretches government's abilities because um, they're working in tight timelines, they're often working with incomplete information and in unfamiliar territory, and things are just very difficult. Communications internally are also hard. And so governments, all of that adds up to a real challenge to govern well. Wouldn't it be nice if we had had a prior example of a, of a Fiona in order that we could have gathered information from that event, to have sat down, looked at lessons learned, developed a playbook that we could have taken off the shelf when Fiona hit, and rolled out a coherent, effective plan across government. It's shocking to me 
the, the Dorian report from 2019 was so ignored in such a wholesale manner. I'm not suggesting that the report was comprehensive enough. I don't think it was, and that's why the last, uh, the last operative clause of this motion is to call for a public inquiry, because I don't, I'm going to get to that later. Um, but the fact that we, we had an inquiry, insubstantial and not as comprehensive as, as we needed it to be, but the fact that we had one with a number of very clear recommendations, which were not in the interim between that event and Fiona. Now, they were not comparable in terms of their scale, and we looked at the statistics just the other day when EMO was in here and Maritime Electric were in here and all of the other organizations that spoke before standing committee in the last couple of weeks. And you can see that the scale of destruction related to Fiona was, was significantly and sometimes 10 times more destructive than Dorian. But the essence of the problem was the same. And the fact that we did not learn from, and that was the same administration that was in power in 2019 and was as, as was in power when Fiona made landfall just a few weeks ago. The fact that they did not take the information, that valuable, invaluable information that we learned at that time and crafted a plan to make our response to Fiona so much more effective than it was is a real failure of this administration. I think it's really important that we make a distinction between government's responsibilities, and that would be in terms of preparedness and in terms of response, and what happened in the community. I, I, want, I cannot praise enough the efforts of a number of groups, first responders, who were there on the night of Fiona trying to deal with extraordinary problems, fires at Stanhope Golf Course, for example, that they could not physically get to. I can only imagine uh, uh, spending your life as a firefighter, arriving at the scene on a night like that, uh, in a situation like that, and, and not being able to carry out your job. That must have been just horrendous for them. But of course, they, they carried out very many successful rescues. In my own district, a family, um, the, the house, uh, the roof of their house uh, essentially blew off, not the whole thing, so. but enough of it that they had to be moved out of their house at the height of the storm at about two or three o'clock on that Saturday morning. And they live, um, I, I don't want to, I don't want to identify the family too clearly, but th they live uh, in my district. And they called 911, a large family, uh, I, I might say. Uh, they called 911, and fire and police arrived at their house within minutes and evacuated the family from the residence. Again, this is in the pitch black. The storm is as wild as it was going to be at any point during Fiona. And the first responders, they had a, this family had a van actually a school bus in which they, they travel. And they were taken from their house and they were escorted by the first responders into town, into Charlottetown. On the way, part of their vehicle blew off and they could not drive any further. And the first responders moved the family, many children, into their trucks and their vans and their cars and took them to a shelter in Charlottetown. In fact, they took them to first responder facilities. That's just one example oh. of what first responders did at the height of that storm and continue to do when, the, when we had representatives from the fire department here just the other day. They cataloged how many calls they're still getting on a, a daily basis from islanders where there are trees hung up on lines, where there are issues with their property, where there are continuing fallout from Fiona, and, 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 they, and they continue to take calls on a daily basis. So I absolutely take my hat off to the first responders who 
at the height of the storm were there and three weeks later continue to be there serving islanders selflessly. Mm -hmm. The vast majority, almost 100% of the first responders, the fire, fire service here, volunteers, and the work that they have done and continue to do is, is just absolutely admirable, and, and I thank them from the bottom of my heart for that. The lines people who restored electricity across the island, and as I think the minister said in his budget address, this was the first instance in Canadian history since we've had electricity where an entire province lost the complete, um, the system went down, the whole grid went down simultaneously. And yes, it took a long time to get it back. And I think the scope, the magnitude of the damage that was done as a result of this storm was not, I, I, don't, think it was, I don't think it was even possible for people to, to clearly have a picture of just how bad things were. And I know we were told originally it's just going to be a few days. You know, it may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, but we're, we're going to get your power back. And I think all of us knew deep down in our hearts that this was not something that was going to be done in a few days. It was going to take a very long time. And sure enough, two, three weeks later, some islanders still were left without power. But that's not because the lines people were not doing their job. I don't know how many of us here in this room came across crews um, in our day-to-day -day travels around the province. I certainly saw dozens of them, um, spoke to dozens of crews during those couple of weeks. Crews from, of course, the island here, folks who were based here, crews from New Brunswick, crews from Nova Scotia, crews from, from Quebec, crews from Ontario, and even further afield. Some crews from Newfoundland, some crews from BC and out west, and, and some American crews here as well, linesmen who came up here from Maine and other states in the US to help with the, with the restoration of power. And without exception, the ones that I spoke to, and most of the time they didn't really want to speak to me, they just wanted to get on with their work, and I, I absolutely applaud them for that. Um, but you could tell from the accent right away where, where they were from, oh, there's a Newfoundland crew, or there's a crew from New York, or whatever. Um, they were all extremely professional in, in what they did and worked extraordinarily long hours in order to do what they did. And the work of those frontline folks who restored power to an entire island that was stamped on in a way that we've never experienced before uh, was quite extraordinary. So thank you to the the operators, the, the, the line crews who were here, lines people. And then we come to the volunteers in our community. In my opening remarks in this house, both today and yesterday, I, I talked at length about the experience that I had in my district. Uh, three centres that were opened, um, one in Afton Hall, with the rural municipality of West River, one in the Kingston Legion, which is also in that municipality, and one in Emmyvale, in Kingston Emmyvale municipality. And in all of those places, it was volunteers who came out. It was community leaders who, you know, I, I choose that, I choose those two words really carefully and thoughtfully because these were people at a time where their community needed to be led and needed to be nurtured and needed to be taken care of and loved and hugged. They were the ones who came out. Some of them were elected officials. I think at Afton Hall, I saw every single member of the interim council that makes up the rural municipality of West River. Um, I saw the staff, Lala Johanslu is the CAO and, and other people who work there. And I also saw dozens of community volunteers who came forward, community leaders, and were there peeling carrots. They were there fixing people's internet problems. They were there making sure that people had hot water. The guys from Nine Mile Creek who operate the, um, the lobster pound there came daily with a massive box of ice 
so that people could, those without power were able to keep their, freezer, their freezers and their, their fridges going. It was, uh, it was quite an extraordinary thing. And of course, that happened all across the province. My main experience was within my own district, as I'm sure all of us focused our attention on our neighbors and friends to make sure that the people in our community were being taken care of. And, and that, that was replicated and echoed across this province. But I want to make special note of a group of people who sprung up in response to a very large gap in government's response to this tragedy. And that, that group arose in Charlottetown. And it started off as a very ad hoc group of a few people who were concerned about their neighbors and friends. And it grew to become Charlottetown Mutual Aid, an organization with no prior history, no structure as such, no funding, no board to manage it. Although I have to tell you, they were extraordinarily well, effectively, efficiently managed. It was an organic process through which they organized them, themselves and uh, egalitarian. It was a beautiful thing to watch, actually. And if you had the privilege of dropping in to Charlottetown Mutual Aid at the locations, that the many locations, actually three at least, that I, I was aware of uh, that they occupied during this time, you saw community in action. You saw people, many of them, no better off than the folks that they were helping without power, without water, without lights. And yet, what they had was generosity of heart. What they had was a willingness to come together and to be there for their, for their community. And they did an absolutely extraordinary job. When I look at the number of people who were directly helped by Charlottetown Mutual Aid and the scope and the breadth and the depth of the assistance that they offered across this province, then my heart is full and uh, I, I, I'm just absolutely blown away by their commitment and the work that they did. Mr. Speaker, it's time for me to adjourn debate on this motion and I call for adjourn of debate, um, seconded by Summerside Wilmot. <coughs> Should I carry? Carry. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, third party house leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The third party calls motion 118. No. 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 Oh, sorry. <laughs> My bad. The Honourable Member from Tignesh Pomerog, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, on behalf of the Standing Committee of the Legislative Assembly um, <laughs> Management, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Election Act Number 2, and I move seconded by the Leader of the Opposition that the same be now received and read a first time. So let's carry. Yeah. Oh, we got an overview? No, sorry. Remember, give it to give it to the clerk. I'll give you a quick. Okay. Let's clerk read it. Okay. Yes, thank you. Bill number 120, an act to amend the Election Act number two, read a first time. Overview, member. <laughs> Sorry about I'm that. Excited. Yeah. I'm excited. Uh, this bill defines the authority of the Chief Electoral Officer of the Legislative Assembly to enter into contracts. <clears throat> Honorable members, as pursuant to Rule 95, oh, does it? Oh, I'm sorry. Do you have another bill? The Honourable Member from Tignish Pomerog, De Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On behalf of the Standing Committee on Legislative Assembly Management, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Legislative Assembly Act, and I move, seconded by the member from Mermaid Stratford, that the same be now received and read a first time. Shall it carry?
Bill number 126, an act to amend the Legislative Assembly Act. Read a first time. Overview, member? Mr. Speaker, this, this bill amends goes, right? the Legislative Assembly Act to reflect the change of the Monarch in the MLA oath. Honorable members, this bill comes under Rule 95. <laughs> Do you have another bill? Yes. <laughs> the Honorable Member from Tignesh, Palmer Rogue, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I move, I beg leave to introduce the bill to be in Titual um, Election Signage Act. And I move second by the member from O'Leary and Verness that the bill uh, do now be received and read a first time. Shall it carry? Bill number 127, Election Signage Act, read a first time. Overview, member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The legislation aims to modern, modernize the way we use election signage in our provincial elections. The bill provides limitations on both the number and placement of signage during an election period. The spirit behind this bill is to address growing concerns uh, around both the environmental impact and public safety issues with our historical use of election signage. This bill is the first of its kind for provincial jurisdictions and could make PEI a leader in addressing these long-standing concerns. Now, honorable members, this bill, under Rule 95, this bill stands committed to the Standing Committee on Legislative Assembly, Assembly Management for consideration upon first reading. Got it. I should have read all my notes, right? The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, third party House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. At this time, I'll call motion 118. Shall it carry? Carry. Motion 118. The Member for O'Leary and Verness moves, seconded by the Member for Charlottetown West Royalty, the following motion. Whereas the COVID-19 pandemic has caused unprecedented strain to the already fragile health care system in Prince Edward Island. And whereas all staff within our health care system, regardless of their position, were required to make significant changes in their day-to-day -day operations to support the system through this challenging time and continue to do so. And whereas prior to and during the pandemic, Health PEI's workplace culture has been described as unsupportive and toxic with employees feeling underappreciated and undervalued. And whereas recent retention incentives announced by government excluded many staff that are vital to the province's COVID-19 response, and went above and beyond what was previously required in their role. And whereas, by excluding professions within the recently announced retention incentives could cause further division, job dissatisfaction, and new vacancies within the unrecognized professions at Health PEI. And whereas, it takes all members of the healthcare team to provide quality, safe, and compassionate care to Islanders, and no one profession should be seen as more important than the other, than another. Therefore, we resolve the Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island urged government to provide a retention incentive to all health PEI staff that were ex excluded from the recently announced retention incentives. Therefore, be it further resolved, the Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island urged government to exclude health PEI executive leadership from this incentive. The Honorable Member from O'Leary Inferness, third party whip to start debate. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and maybe I'll request the podium. Uh, let's sure. Where it's, where it's at there, but uh, podium. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we get it right on the right side this time. Is it the right way? Yeah. 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 Anyway, Mr. Speaker, uh, this I feel is a motion that uh, I wanted to bring forward, and obviously I had addressed some questions in the legislature here recently just regarding uh, the issue of um, some sort of a bonus, an incentive, or something that's going to help retain uh, our workforce in our uh, important industries of health care, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, as a former Minister of Health, I, I understand the challenges that ministers have when interceding into uh, what I'll say is a, a machine of delivery of health care here that, uh, you know, all partners, it's a team approach here, everybody plays a role. And I don't care whether that's the, the uh, 
person who does the maintenance, uh, shovels the snow and the sidewalks to, to get into the health care facilities after a storm, Mr. Speaker, the people who work in the boiler rooms, the, the people who uh, do lab work, uh, medical secretaries. The list goes on, Mr. Speaker, of health care delivery in this province. And I have to admit, on October 18th, when the Premier and his government announced an $8 million uh, program heavily focused on the retention of RNs, LPNs, and RCW, I was really puzzled by this because I felt that uh, when you single out certain professions in the healthcare delivery, you're, you're going to create uh, a work environment that's going to be difficult at the best of times, Mr. Speaker. These people are under tremendous stress. And uh, when uh, an RN may be requesting a uh, lab results back or uh, if uh, somebody has to type something up uh, to uh, document a form or whatever, uh, you wonder whether they're saying, well, you know, I, you got the bonus, I didn't, uh, I'll get to that when I, when I can, versus the attitude of saying, I'm going to really dig in and help and appreciate everybody here in this, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, those are the types of things that I would say are pitfalls when, uh, when a government intervenes. And so, you know, I feel now you have to try to deal with this issue. You have to try to reconcile the fact that some people got money, some people didn't. And, uh, you know, it, it, uh, is, it has to be addressed and corrected. And, uh, you know, I, I also felt that uh, it puts government in a very, uh, this announcement, especially for any of the ones that you didn't already uh, have a uh, contract signed with, because uh, the collective bargaining process is an arduous process at the best of times, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, there's a number of uh, union agreements that have not been signed. They've expired for some time. And I think that's going to put government uh, in an awkward spot because I think those people are going to be wanting that uh, is, is going to be included in the discussions. What that means that it's more money. It's a, it's going to be a tougher agreement to uh, to reach, Mr. Speaker. So I think uh, you know certainly I would say that if I had been involved in that situation, I would have said let's get our collective bargaining agreement settled. Let's uh, get everybody on the same page and and uh, then move forward in that, Mr. Speaker. But to, uh, to turn around in a situation where some people have certainly have called and reached out to me, have had numerous uh, emails and texts. You know, some people got, uh, you know, executive uh, uh, leadership people got a big bonus. They got their money for no problem at all, Mr. Speaker. Then all of a sudden we've got an announcement that said that, you know, some of them are going to get two, three thousand dollars, fifteen hundred, whatever the number is. It's kind of a, a mixed uh, shot. And then there's the, the rest of them left. What did they get? flashlights, and I might add cheap flashlights, because most oh. of them said they didn't work any l longer than maybe a half hour after the power went out. Oh. <laughs> lavender seeds, which I thought, where the heck did they get lavender seeds, and what was the purpose of that? Well, it was there, it's uh, soothing and serene, I'm told, that sort of get you through the health care system. <laughs> and then also the toe pig, chocolate-covered potato chips, Mr. Wow. Speaker. Chocolate-covered potato chips. And why, why would that be? Well, that the note sense. said they're just so darn good, Mr. Speaker. So, <laughs> nothing says thank you more. Yeah, nothing says thank you more than that. So, you know, so I think that the reality is some of them said the flashlights didn't work. I didn't know. I tried to smoke the lavender seeds. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, the, yeah, well, it, there were some people were told where they could shove the flashlights, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes the sun doesn't shine, you need flashlights. But these ones didn't work very long, Mr. Speaker. So then you add in the, into the, uh, the situation, they tried to smoke the lavender seeds that didn't seem to have any impact at all. And some of the chocolate-covered potato chips, well, they all uh, melted together. Some of them were <laughs> that fresh. Uh -huh. So, uh, you know, it was just a, a, bad, a bad decision by someone. And I'm still trying to, as I ask questions here, who signed off on that? I'd really like to know that at some point in time. I'd like to see who the brave person is that stands up and said, I signed off on that. I thought it was a great idea. So, but we'll see. We'll see. Maybe the, maybe the minister knows who signed off on that. Maybe he did. I don't know. But uh, it certainly seems to be a questionable move. But, but the idea of giving money to these prof professions that are in high demand and proving difficult to retain with the state of our health care system is not what the issue is here, Mr. Speaker. I, get, I certainly understand totally the issue of individuals that were eligible to retire. I mean, I, you know, if, if you can provide an incentive for those individuals uh, to stay on longer, I, I certainly get that. I, I, and I, I would applaud them on that side of it. But then to add in everything else, you're starting to develop the jealousies and, and animosity. I think the professions uh, do need to be incentivized to stay in the system, not supported 
uh, them at the past three and a half years because we know that they're in short supply, Mr. Speaker. And uh, those that are about to retire, you know, they are probably going to need those types of incentives, Mr. Speaker. The issue I have around here is how this program was delivered, how it was communicated, the strategy and speech by the Premier, and the details of this program. You know, I, when I had the opportunity to tour, and I'm sure this minister has done the same, you know, I've toured all the health care facilities in this province. And uh, one of my things that I, when I was going for my tours, I said, I don't want to just visit the emergency rooms. I don't want to just visit, uh, you know, where uh, the doctor's offices are. I want to go to the boiler rooms, Mr. Speaker. I want to, I want to see the whole facility. And I, I remember uh, going to a couple of facilities. That, dude, ne never had a, an elected official come in here before. And I believe, actually, Mr. Speaker, when we toured your facility, <laughs> you were with me. And uh, we went around to all the places. And of course, you're a very uh, capable individual in uh, knowing how to meet people and greet people. And, and you were that type of mindset, too. You wanted to see the, the boiler rooms, and you wanted to see all the, the uh, facility in its whole, and all those people that play a role in the delivery of health care, Mr. Speaker. So I do believe you know, that's something, I, and I say, I cannot speak for any other minister who's done that. But uh, I always felt that that was important because I did feel it was very appreciative of everybody's role in the healthcare delivery uh, aspect of uh, healthcare in Prince Edward Island. You know, the other part, the message of the premier in this announcement, I felt was a, a bit lacking. If you're going to give incentives to workers because they're leaving at alarming rates, and we need to retain them, great. I totally understand that. But the mistake was to even bring in the COVID issue. Well, we're appreciative of those people because of COVID. And that was an issue I had even within this legislature here. There was times where we said we shouldn't, ha we shouldn't be meeting. But how do I say that we're an essential worker, or a health care worker is an essential worker, and, uh, you know, the, our, our people who worked in our, in our stores and uh, grocery stores, they're essential workers. They have to go to work every day. So I felt it was important that you did show up and you, you did do what you can to provide the level of service. And, you know, so if you're saying that's the issue that you were, well, one of the reasons why you're providing these incentives, then you have to understand that everybody that played a role in that is, should also be part of that incentive. How some would, would get a, a, a bonus or an incentive to show up and then another one doesn't. So a medical secretary, you get nothing. You get the lavender seeds and the, and the flashlights. But, you know, the RN, she gets a little bit different dynamic. And I get all professions have different levels of education and different areas of expertise, but everybody plays a role in that, Mr. Speaker. So the Premier talked about how vital all these individuals were when the COVID response, uh, but, you know, and how imperative they were in keeping our public safe and stable positions during our darkest days of, a, of the COVID pandemic, how hardworking and challenging these people were and, and the circumstances they had to deal with. But yet, they got nothing but the flashlights and, and uh, chips. As I said in my questions yesterday to the minister, they, you know, those people that we did provide themselves, yes, they did. They worked hard. I get that. But so did many others, hundreds of others, yes. professions. I don't know how many workers are within the health PEI and health and wellness department, but, you know, I'm guessing, I think in my time it was between five and 6,000. So it's probably in that vicinity, maybe a little bit more, but maybe you haven't been able to fill many positions, so maybe it's less. Uh, but uh, to intentionally exclude probably about 70% of the health PEI workforce, I felt was a, an extreme disservice to those hardworking people that were left out. And uh, I think it's going to be a hard issue for to try to resolve this issue when you get into uh, trying to conclude your collective bargain agreements, in which some of them I think are a couple of years in, in, ex in expiration. And, uh, you know, that's going to cost a fair bit of money at some point in time to bring that to a proper conclusion, Mr. Speaker. Health PEI certainly has a lot of uh, full-time equivalent positions, and uh, only thanking a fraction of them is uh, certainly a disservice, and I understand totally that it does take a complete team to uh, deliver health care in the province of Prince Edward Island, Mr. Speaker. Not to mention, you did this in, at their workforce, or at the workplace, Mr. Speaker. Sometimes uh, having announcements of this nature, when they were right in their face, basically, that you're getting nothing while others did, probably would be a little bit of a salt in the wound for some of them. I'm sure there would be people that would be sitting around uh, uh, following uh, the procedures and the announcements and find out my colleague next to me got a bonus and I get nothing. So 
you know, that's, that's the type of stuff that we have to be very careful of, and I think it's almost insulting. And I think in one of our legislative committee meetings, we had one of the union reps here, and I think the comment was, or the quote was, it was a complete slap in the face to her union uh, uh, people who worked so hard and that she tries to represent. So, uh, you know, so those are the types of things that we have to, so all this is going to do is create further division amongst our professions. I know they're professional people. I know they'll overcome that. But uh, when they get home at the end of a hard uh, day and uh, having to deal with all of the issues that they face in the run of a day and the challenge, they are going to start to think a little bit about, gee, that flashlight just not cutting it anymore for me as <coughs> far as an incentive. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to sting a little bit, Mr. Speaker, for some of them. You know, so, uh, and, and it also creates that hierarchy of, uh, of, uh, in the, within the workplace. Once again, elect, uh, executive leadership, they got bonuses, although we're not sure the amount just yet. I hope the minister will, will find that out eventually, I'm sure. And, uh, but yet, no cooks, no cleaners. They didn't get nothing. Respiratory th uh, th therapists, of all the people for COVID, <laughs> they got nothing. Uh, uh, lab technicians, Mr. Speaker, I, I know I've been to the lab at the QEH. Uh, they are really working hard in there. I think they're having the same challenges as so many hard to get lab technologists. And, uh, you know, so, and without the lab results of the tests that they have to do, nobody can make a decision on anything. So they're a pretty in integral part of our health care delivery, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, just like I said, the maintenance workers, the people that keep the heat on, our health care systems have uh, unique arrangements. Some of them have biomass burners that are kind of done by a third party and uh, government buys the heat that they create. Sometimes they're working, sometimes they're not. The, the boiler maintenance people have to keep, uh, keep uh, the heat going, have to keep it consistent. A lot of technology that they're involved with. Most of them are on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as the saying goes, Mr. Speaker. And uh, all they get is flashlights and lavender seeds, Mr. Speaker. Uh, very, very disappointing that uh, that, that would happen. So, so potentially this is going to, in my opinion, could create more staff shortages and, and vacancies. It's short-sighted on that part. Uh, when you forget certain professions, they feel undervalued. They don't feel the, feel the love anymore and the appreciation. And... Uh, now, you know, some of them may decide to change professions. I had uh, one constituent reach out to me who uh, works in the lab is now thinking about going to another direction, Mr. Speaker. I don't know if that's the only reason because of this, but she just doesn't feel that the job is exciting enough anymore to, uh, to try to continue on uh, within it. So we know workplace dissatisfaction and the way health PEI straight treated their staff was poor to begin with. But now it's going to even be worse, Mr. Speaker. We know the horror stories we continue to hear every day that retention among all health PEI is becoming an issue because how they are treated. Look no further than the 2021 Garth Waite report to show nearly 50% of all departing staff say a toxic workplace was the primary reason for leaving alone, uh, leaving along with the issues of work-life balance, the ability to access uh, vacation time, violence towards staff, unsupportive and top-heavy management, these issues don't discriminate against specific professions. They are deep-seated systematic issues, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, I've raised questions today in the legislature again about our long-term care. You know, uh, I think we have 1,560 long-term care designated beds in this province of Prince Edward Island. The minister uh, con uh, confirmed that there's 60-some beds sitting empty sitting empty. empty, nobody in them, yet we, he didn't know his numbers are waiting long-term care and kind of gave a convoluted answer to why he didn't know those numbers, but I'm quite confident he does know those numbers. Uh, when I was minister, I did know those numbers, Jen. You kept a pretty good close eye on that. You tried to make sure that your beds were full because it was a, it was a more uh, proper way to get people to get the proper treatment and assessment and care that they, uh, that, that they are deserving. But if you're just going to fill beds and you don't have the staff complement to do it, what are we going to see, Mr. Speaker? You're obviously going to see a situation where the patient care time is going to reduce. You're, uh, I think the, the standard is about four hours a day, I remember in a committee meeting here, uh, that, uh, of patient care that goes into a 24-hour day. And that's where a person actually gets to, to help feed somebody, sit and talk with them, uh, try to... Uh, 
do a little bit of uh, movement exercises, all those things, that's a level of care that would be generally. But if you're gonna, you're gonna have 100 and some empty beds, now down to 60 beds, but you're just gonna keep filling those beds and you don't have any more staff, something's gotta give, Mr. Speaker. So we've seen this happen in Ontario, happened big time. In fact, the military, when it was called, called in in the pandemic, said they found people in deplorable situations. We've seen people with bed sores. We've seen, you know, situations where people weren't getting proper nourishment. So if we get down to, you're only going to see maybe a, an hour, an hour and a half a day of patient care, what kind of level of care is that? I had a, I had a, con, uh, a former constituent, I guess, she's actually living now in the minister's uh, riding, reached out to me uh, last night, her granddaughter did actually, showed me some pictures of, I'll say, a deplorable situation of uh, a person that is awaiting long-term care in a hospital bed, getting no care, deteriorating fast, the eyesight's poor, the families happen to go and feed this, uh, their, their mother, grandmother in this situation, and uh, because there, there's no patient care, no services. You can't, you can't allow people to live in these kind of deplorable situations, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and, and that's the ramifications of situations that are happening in our healthcare system. And you just cannot expect workers to deliver these healthcare services when they're totally overrun, when you're making decisions, I'll say maybe politically, to try to make sure all the beds are full now. We've got a legislature just coming on here, big push to get everybody in a bed. And I'm told there's more of that happening. So if we get all those 60 beds filled and you didn't, hi and you didn't uh, hire any more people to do that, something's going to give. Something, something very negative is going to happen here, Mr. Speaker. And I want to say that I'm warning this government of that. The Doug Ford government get into that big time. I know the Premier was up having barbecues with Premier Ford, good buddies. Maybe he's learning a lesson. Oh, Ford says, just go. Don't, you need, don't need any workers in there to do anything. Just fill the beds full, get them full. That, maybe that's the advice he was getting. <coughs> I would say that's foolhardy advice, Mr. Speaker, definitely. We also seen not long ago that the QEH emergency room nurses were sounding the alarm this summer that violence they continue to face in the emergency department from patients is proving that. And that's, you know, that's unfortunate, Pe but people are frustrated. Everybody's frustrated. The wait times are excessively long. People are sitting in an ambulance uh, waiting to be discharged. They, they can't get into the emergency room. Uh, people are told to go back home regularly, Mr. Speaker. And the best we can get from our big city health guru is, well, we got the pharmacies. We're going to have the pharmacies do more work. And I totally believe that we need to do, have our pharmacies play a greater role in our health care system. But the announcement of the services that they, <laughs> they announced, dandruff, minor acne, sore throat, I was, if you went into your pharmacist before you were getting that, you got it for free this time, they'd give you some advice. Now you're paying three and a half million dollars to get the same service. Now there was one, I'm going to give the government good credit on one thing that I th thought was good in that announcement was that uh, the renewal of some minor prescriptions. So I, I certainly get that that's something that our pharmacists can do just on their own and they will look at that. And I know in the capital budget they're talking a little bit about some uh, resources for uh, electronic medical records to allow the uh, pharmacists to have access to uh, our electronic medical records of uh, healthcare files within the, the hospitals and our uh, doctors. But that's not delivered yet. They couldn't get the electronic medical record system out. It failed, and, and uh, they had to start over again on that. So I'm going to hold up a little bit of judgment to see what that's going to happen, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I would be certainly wonder when I look at uh, the report that comes out on family doctors why a lot of them have left their practice, or even if they are getting exit surveys. But, but I just look at the situation in Western PEI, Mr. Speaker, in, in my own area. We've seen doctors leave at a an appalling rate, Mr. Speaker, and I had the opportunity to meet and talk with some of them uh, myself, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, I, I hear Jolly Moore is leaving, Fox has left, uh, we've got uh, uh, Montgomery, I think, has given his notice that he's leaving. There's three, this is over 30 percent of our capacity of delivering health care to the province of PEI gone, are going, all shortly coming up. Don't see a whole lot of replacements coming. Now, I have to admit, O'Leary's a little bit of a different situation. 
Valeria, I think, has four physicians, and I believe they're all still practicing in O'Leary, and uh, uh, that seems to be working good. And I will say that other than the, the minister pulling the ambulatory care services out of O'Leary, which have been reinstated, I, I thank you for that. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, it's been working actually quite well. And I, I appreciate that, that we have a fairly good complement of physicians. We've got, uh, we're doing some COVID testing. We're doing, uh, uh, you know, with the health center there, we've got our delivery of a, uh, an acute care beds. We're dealing with restorative and convalescent and palliative care. And uh, then there's a long-term care section that uh, all seems to be working pretty good and very few staffing issues. Not saying that, that we're immune, but very few in general terms. It's the model he should be replicating in other parts of the province, Mr. Speaker. But it's a house of cards, Mr. Speaker. You start pulling people out. You, you lose the ambulatory care service. That leaves. Now all of a sudden, people aren't going to the facility and getting the treatments that they, they have to go. Now they have to go to an emergency room. Now they have to go to another facility to get those services. You start losing a few more doctors. That starts to fade away a little bit. And uh, now all of a sudden the doctors that are there say, I can't handle the coverage anymore. We've got too much, too much to handle. It's a house of cards, Mr. Speaker. So very important that uh, the health care delivery is figured out and that you deal with issues around model of care, uh, scopes of practice. Those are the types of issues that at least you can kind of get through situations. I was, you know, certainly when the issue happened that uh, the ambulatory care services were pulled out of O'Leary, I found out to constituents, nobody had the decency to give the MLA a call, but, but <laughs> heaven said that, Not so we're over. I, did, I did find out, okay. and of course I make some calls, oh it's just temporary, it's just temporary, I said well what's temporary mean, <laughs> what's, what's that mean, you. You. well I don't know what temporary means was the response back, <laughs> I said well it is temporary, would you define it in uh, months or would you define it in weeks? Oh, not months, uh, uh, Mr. MLA, not months. I said, okay, that's, that's fair enough then. I, at least now I've got some parameters. So when the, the three, three and a half weeks was up, or coming to the fourth week, which starts to get into the word month versus week, I make a few calls. Is our ambulatory care going to be reinstated? And I did have calls. I mentioned with Allison Ellis, the former MLA here. You know, he'd contacted me uh, about that particular issue. Well, we don't have a date yet. We don't have. I said, well, your term, your time is kind of coming here. It's, we're into, we're going to be into months, so that's kind of against what I was thinking. So I'm going to do, uh, take this upon myself and maybe go public with this. Lo and behold, I think about, I want to say seven or eight hours later, I get a call. <laughs> Did you send do anything yet? I said, no, I didn't. Uh, I've got a press release ready to go here. We're probably going to do it tomorrow. Hold on. I think I've got an, a, a date for you. Wow, interesting. <laughs> I said, well, I'm a fair person, and I'll, I'll work with you to uh, have that happen. So, I've, you know, obviously I was working with the hospital foundation at the time, as I know you would, Mr. Speaker. You have a good relationship with your hospital foundation. So, anyway, I said, well, I'm going to hold off a little bit. Sure enough, I get word back. It's coming on this particular date. I said, well, okay, it's not immediate, but I, at least now there's a date. I feel now it's a matter of making sure that you deliver on that date. So I did, a, I did do a press release to announce that it's returning. So, I, you know, at least I was hold, I, the reason I did that was I wanted to make sure I was holding the minister to account that uh, there is going to be a date, that the words were good here. And uh, sure enough, it, they did deliver. Uh, and I say the sad part of it, I guess, from an Allison Ellis, the former MLA for Second Prince, who so passionately spoke in this legislature in our community about health care, uh, was that uh, it did return on the morning of, that, of the 15th, I believe it was, and uh, unfortunately Allison uh, passed away that evening. So I would hope that he at least had the satisfaction that the O'Leary Hospital was left in a good state of affairs when he passed out of this world. So, uh, so I certainly commended his passion, but I also have learned from his passion, and that's why I wanted to be very respectful and tactful with this government over 
the reinstatement of ambulatory care services. And in fact, I was talking uh, last night with some people, and they said it's actually working pretty good, and they're quite pleased with uh, the individual that they have in that position, local girl. She seems to be full of uh, excitement and, and passion about ambulatory care delivery. And uh, in fact, I think this government, I'll be give them another bit of credit too. I'm not sure how much the minister knows on all of these files, but the reality is I watch O'Leary's pretty closely, and I'm told that there's going to be some supports for our ambulatory care. So I do thank the minister for, you know, at least not stopping any of these things from happening, that, that we hopefully will have solidified ambulatory care services uh, in the... But I will say, and I, I'll be watching O'Leary pretty closely, be careful what you do in O'Leary. It's working really good. Don't mess with it. it uh, uh, and, uh, you know, we'll do our very best to work with this government to make sure it's able to deliver. We understand the challenges of health care, and I'm not saying everything should be O'Leary, although some might not want to travel for COVID testing in O'Leary from Summerside, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I had to go, our, my constituents had to drive to Summerside for Red Cross services too, so for, and we shouldn't have to have done that either, but that's just the way, the way this thing works uh, sometimes, Mr. Speaker. But I do get concerned when we start to see our physicians leaving uh, and not, uh, you know, not a whole pile of replacements. So it's kind of a case you lose two, you get one, you know, you're out. But we're kind of seeing the system erode a little bit. And we're, you know, waiting, uh, you know, the, this new facility that's going to be in Albert in this medical home or whatever. Uh, we're still not sure where the new people are going to come to fill this big building. And it's not going to happen until after another election anyway. So. Uh, we'll, that's another bridge we'll have to cross in the future. Uh, you know, I'm hoping it's not going to be the new, a new sign goes on that says the future home of the Western Hospital, but there are certainly comments that have been made to that capacity. I'm not, I'm not spreading it, but maybe I am. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, after the outcry from certain unions representing the forgotten heroes of government took into another kick at them when they were down by saying the appropriate way to get their members more money is through the collective bargaining process. I think these individuals deserve more a formal, heartfelt thank you rather than saying our appreciation for them will be shown in our collective agreements. And it's got to be more than, than uh, the situation of uh, flashlights and lavender seeds and potato chips, Mr. Speaker. So I think that's, uh, that's really important to, to note in all this. So if you're giving incentives to workers because they're leaving at alarming rates and we need to retain them, great. But the mistake was to even bring, uh, oh, to bring more COVID into the situation and using that as an excuse is not where we need to be, Mr. Speaker. The government can't even keep up their sides of the collective agreement. So when they did make the announcements of these bonuses, I've got, I'm getting people calling me, well, where are they? We haven't seen them. I, I, all I can say to them, well, I'm not sure. It, it's, I'm assuming that the, the government's word is good, that you'll get them. But, but uh, you know, it's a little disingenuous to turn around and say you've got a bonus and wait for months before you get it. It's kind of like a lot of the announcements we make here. You, you're getting $1,000, but you're going to have to wait, wait for uh, three or four months to get it. Uh, so it's very important that if governments, I always sort of say in, in the world that I live, and I know you do, Mr. Speaker, say what you're going to do. Do what you're going to set what you said. If you follow those uh, words in this profession, you'll do pretty good. Don't create expectations that aren't realistic. Making wild promises to get you out of a little bit of a bind. If you're in a bind right now, gee, I got, we're losing healthcare workers. We better throw some lavender seeds at them. See what that does. That don't work. Tiny get get a tiny flashlight that uh, runs out of power a half hour of being on. You know, you gotta you gotta come up with something that's a little bit more better than that. Oh, geez. Throw, throw them some a uh, little bit of cash. See what that does. It, it, it reminds me a little bit of uh, not a big Oprah Winfrey show, but I did see something Oprah. Here's a check. A check for you. A check for you. A check for you. <laughs> Everything. Everybody gets a check. Bides you a little bit of time. Problem is, it's your own money that you're getting back. <laughs> you know, I would argue on that comment. If you really wanted to help people, drop drop the HST a percent or two percent. At least it's not inflationary. At least you're lowering the cost of things. And people, you know, it's, it's a fair way of distributing. Taking your own money and then giving it back to you, that's, I, 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 I just, uh, I, I know it's a disingenuous approach, but I mean, I, I, I don't, I see through that, but I know there's lots that probably won't, Mr. Speaker. Certainly the, you know, I certainly fail to see how the collective bargaining is going to help unions. Uh, that have just signed their agreements or have been in the process now for two years. Now they're kind of starting all over from scratch, Mr. Speaker. You know, 
when they see this happening, it kind of tips the scales. You got, you got a, you got a collective bargaining has to happen in good faith. You have to solve the problem. You have to come up with agreement and sign a contract and uh, get people, get people uh, feeling good about their positions, Mr. Speaker. You know, some of these negotiations, over two years they've expired. <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I'm a worker and my employer hasn't signed a contract on two years, you can't come to a conclusion. I don't feel the love from that, Mr. Oh, Speaker. <laughs> I don't feel the appreciation. I don't feel that this is going to make a big difference. Uh, you know, so that's, that's kind of the way I look at some of these things. The simple fact is, you know, it's, it's another one of these kind of smoke and mirror attractions. It's just like when, the, I feel that sometimes the Premier and the Minister, they're sitting up in their, in their ivory towers and they turn around and say, gee, the people aren't real popular. And they almost sort of get some potatoes and cheese out to them as quick as you can. You know, it, it's, <laughs> it's got to be something to throw out, you know, like, let's get some gift cards. We've got to do something here. <laughs> it's getting bad. The polls have dropped, <laughs> you know. And, you know, so I just find that's a, it's a poor way of showing appreciation. Let's, let's get, you know, get down to things. Let's make things real here. And uh, let's get our collective bargaining agreements completed. Let's get our workers all on the same page. And then if, you know, uh, it's a way to let's resolve these issues with health care. Uh, you know, so I, I just feel that a lot of this stuff, they're kind of minor distractions, uh, and I think, believe they're just there to try to keep polling high and attract votes, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, so that, that's the way I sort of look at that. But, but I do believe all our health care workers deserve recognition. They deserve the respect, the thanks, the praise. I know everybody will stand up in this legislature and thank them. I do. I'm the same as I'm so appreciative of the health care workers in, in my district, uh, what they have to go through in the run of a day, uh, work at night sometimes. But that is part of the profession. And they are professionals. They understand that role. But I don't feel they deserve abuse. Uh, you know, I, I don't feel they deserve lavender seeds and chocolate-covered potato chips. I mean, it's, I guess it's something, but it's just, it's, to me, that stuff is disrespectful. Let's show them the money. Let's get the agreements going to what they, they need to do. Uh, you know, uh, I, just, I just wonder, I still got to say, I got to wonder who, who signed off in that lavender seeds and flashlight thing. I got to know that someday. I with the scars and the ears. Yeah, I, I think, I th cigars. <laughs> Cigars and beer. I don't know about that one, but but you know uh, that that's got to be. It's got to be some. I, I'm sure there was somebody in the office. We've got to think of good things to do, and I, I get that part. I appreciate that. You know, there's uh, staff uh, ideas, but somebody has to sign off. And, and like I said, I have no idea what kind of money they spent. I'm going to be curious to know where they bought the flashlights. You know. You know, uh, well, you know, I hope it, I, I hope it's a, a genuine place. Uh, you know, with the lavender seeds, where did they come from? I know. I, well, I, I will say, I, I wonder if they didn't get it through some sort of a gift bonus points or something there. Now they're doing some stuff with the pharmacies. I wonder maybe the minister's getting optimum points and he's turning around and he's turning around and reimbursing them for flashlights. I, I, I don't know. But, but you know, where, where did they get those things? So I kind of know where the chocolate-covered potato chips are. They're cows. Well, oh, I get lots of time. That's, that's, we get more. Yeah. But, uh, you know, so I, I guess I, as I am trying to wrap up a little bit and let my uh, partner have a go at uh, this tag team match that we're, we're here. There is only three of us, so it's a tough. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, uh, I certainly would love to know some of these things. Uh, you know, I would hope that they'll complete the complete negotiations on the expired contracts. That should be their number one priority, their objective. Get that done. All this other stuff is uh, is smoke and mirrors, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you know, government should have known that this would be a strategy that, uh, you know, I know it's a divide and conquer strategy among the professions, but the delivery of health care is a complete team approach. It just has to be that way uh, because lives de depend on it. Lives matter and, and the uh, proper treatment of people and respect of the patients. We always have to remember the patient should be the number one issue in health care. I, I can remember many times sitting around uh, meeting rooms, and I know the minister would be a similar situation to me, and uh, you're probably the least, least educated person around the room, the, the least paid probably even around the room, but I always sort of said my role here is to represent the patient. 
When I'm sitting around here and I'm saying I want to make sure the patient is getting the delivery of service that they need to get, that's a role that I can play. I don't want, you know, we always have to keep that front and center, Mr. Speaker. You know, uh, you know, long-term care beds, we have that many long-term care beds, uh, that's certainly something that I'm really concerned about as we're moving forward. Uh, these long-term care beds have to be staffed appropriately. Uh, I tabled a petition yesterday, Mr. Speaker. I guess actually I tabled a document, just to correct myself a bit on that, uh, uh, on uh, our private and non-governmental long-term care facilities. They also are getting nothing out of this. Their workers did yeoman's duty during uh, COVID. Those people uh, show up every day. They're trying to deliver those services. Our government pays for those beds. We have a contract. And over half our beds, a half of those 1,500 beds, are in private non-governmental uh, facilities. Those people are as just as deserving. They aren't getting anything from the RCW, RN, or, or LPN, and RN bonuses at all. They didn't even get the lavender seeds or the chocolate-covered potato chips, Mr. Speaker. They got nothing. So, you know, that's the type of stuff that uh, needs to be addressed here, Mr. Speaker. And I don't want to see that, like I say before, we treat our seniors in a place where you're just shoving the, the food tray under the, under the, the door, Mr. Speaker, and hoping somebody's going to come and crawl their way to the... the door and get the food and eat it and put it back out. That's what I do not want to see. That's a, but that's the type of stuff that's happened in, in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Pretty, pretty nasty stuff. And uh, so I certainly see that something I just don't want to see. So there's an old saying, Mr. Speaker, that you have to acknowledge that there's a problem before you're going to have any way of solving it. And you have to be fair and, uh, and that's the key. It should be fairness is the mantra should be of all governments and all elected officials that we're going to be fair. And we're going to, they're going to correct this issue, this imbalance, and try to make sure that uh, these people get their, uh, all the other professions that deliver health care in this province and in their private and non-governmental facilities will get some services. So therefore, Mr. Speaker, I certainly uh, urge this government to uh, basically deal with this issue and provide incentive uh, initiatives to uh, all our health care workers on Prince Edward Island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty and the third party House Leader. I don't think we're, no, I'm not going to need that. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to thank my colleague from O'Leary and Vanessa for those brief remarks. So. <laughs> Anyway, he made a lot of good points, and you know he's 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 in, an incredible advocate for healthcare, and always was. And I've learned a great deal from him, so that was that was very important. And it's an honor to to stand up and second this motion, uh, aimed at recognizing and incentivizing the forgotten healthcare heroes, really, and their contribution to our system over a difficult two and a half, maybe three years. It's especially hard for them too, when when a lot of people haven't gotten something and they see a government come out with a good news story of an $83 million surplus and they haven't received anything um, after working through COVID and, and being on the front lines. I, I, I don't know how, how that makes them feel. Well, I do, actually, because I've heard from a lot of them. And, you know, heading into a union negotiation and, 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 and Minister... I made sure during the standing committees, I asked almost two or three times in different ways, have you talked to the government? What do you mean, what do you, mean you haven't talked to the government about an incentive? And they said clearly that they hadn't gotten to that point yet. So um, there, there's definitely some frustration. Uh, no matter your profession, health PEI staff have been asked to do more with less and in more challenging circumstances. This government has failed to appropriately thank their health PI staff for their hard work. And that's something that's going to take a lot of work because I can't imagine coming into a system that's, that's, that's taxed with everything that it's gone through and then taking about one third of that system and giving them, giving them money and then, and then not giving the other people who are doing incredible work and, and sending them back and saying, I, I hope things go well. It's, it's just, it's difficult. And you know what's interesting is that the, 
the people that didn't receive the fund, they're not mad at the nurses. They're not mad at the LPNs. They're, they're not. They're, they're excited for them because they say they deserve that. Uh, yeah, they, they, they deserve that. And they're, that's how much of a team we're really working on right now. But I also want to acknowledge the, the, the great professionals in our private system that also went above and beyond, likely with no recognition at well, uh, no recognition at all. We hear you, uh, we see you, and we thank you for the hard work that you do daily. And you, you, know, you can list off the, the different facilities and the, the private care that they get and the amazing things. I'm already thinking of two or three in my area. Incredible work that, that employees are doing. Um, but I just want to go into uh, a little bit of further detail to, 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 to acknowledge and talk about the, the different people that might, might have been missed out. Um, so service workers, according to Health PEI's annual report, there are 534 service and utility workers who have received nothing from this government, 534. And you think about the important things that they do. These individuals include people like environmental service staff. They were required to participate in, in further courses in education when COVID came about to learn about uh, how their jobs would be adapted and help COVID, uh, combat COVID, the COVID virus. They were the ones cleaning patients' rooms, waiting rooms, COVID units. Imagine the cleaning in hospitals and how many times that th those would have had to been clean over the last two years. ICUs, operating rooms, and so much more to ensure that the environment, environments they were working in were cleaner than they could ever been to limit the trans transmission of the virus. They played crucial roles in ensuring our facilities, newly enhanced cleaning standards were adhered to. These staff also included the great work the porters do, nutritional service workers, how important nutrition is um, uh, to, to, uh, to people requiring help, maintenance staff, laundry service workers, and more all of whom were incredibly important. You know, we can't forget about the, the work that they do. The administrative workers, the ward clerks, the medical secretaries, nothing. Inventory and procurement professionals left out. All of these individuals were forgotten by this government and also were asked to do more with less. Oh, one minute left. Uh, they, were, they were crucial in our efforts in booking COVID vaccine appointments, helping patients navigate the system when we're completely ripped apart by COVID, and the support of frontline workers with numerous administrative tasks as they weren't done. They would, they would have our system lag behind even more. So I'll leave my rest of my notes for, for next time, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, but at this time I'd like to adjourn debate, seconded by uh, Tignish Pomerode. Julie Carey. The Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Land, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the member from Raldona that the 11th order of the day be now read. Sure, Carey. Carey. Oh, yeah. Order number 11, an act to amend the Rental of Residential Property Act, number 2, Bill number 80. In committee. The Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Land, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Premier. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the member from Moraldona that this House to now resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to take into consideration said bill. Sure, Carey. The Honorable Member from Tignish Pomerode, Deputy Speaker, Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please. Oh.
the House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be in titulled an act to amend the rental of residential property act number two. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? Good afternoon. Would you please state your name and position for Hansard? Uh, yes, Vernon McIntyre, and I'm the Legislative Coordinator for Social Development and Housing. Thank you very much, and welcome. Uh, so, honorable members, uh, we, the floor uh, is open for general questions for the bill as a whole. Um, I still have my list from yesterday. I'm going to continue on with that. Um, again, because I have such a long list, I'm going to limit it to about five or six questions, so just keep that in mind. If you want to get back on the list, just let me know. Okay, Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will keep my remarks short. Uh, the, there was some discussion yesterday when we were on the floor with this bill about the um, need for stability, which is what I was speaking to, um, and the comments were um, as much for the future legislation as coming forward, because one of the risks with this that we're hearing from the community is um, if you bring in a zero now, we've obviously got an immediate impact for landlords and then long-term impact potentially for tenants. What are you going to do next year and how are we going to address that? So I think it's really important that um, in the narrative around this that we recognize this is a temporary measure because the RTA is coming um, and this is to take, it's to bridge until that RTA can be proclaimed. It's really critical that in the RTA, so the Residential Tenancy Act, that we see that the rent cap is reflected. And Minister, I think you had, you had stated there will, be. Probably, there will be a rent cap in the RTA. Mm -hmm. Are you able to share what the percentage is that you're considering? No, I want to do the consultation with your office and the third party before we table it, and, okay. but there will be a number there. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. Um, the rent eviction moratorium is another piece of the stability story. Is uh, the rent eviction moratorium going to be carried forward in the RTA? That'll be something else that we can go through. Um, like I say, it's it's not finalized yet. We're in the home stretch, so uh, I believe possibly the first of the week we could sit down with both official opposition and third party, uh, just to go through everything to put the final touches on before we table. Charlotte and Belvedere. And the final piece around stability um, is one of the things that we hear. My colleagues have spoken about this: is the gap between um, the fact that when a, a, a rental increase is issued by the landlord, they have the forms available to them. So they go to the website on the rental office, they print off the forms, they deliver those forms to the tenants, and no one else knows. Right? That's between the tenant and the landlord, because there isn't a requirement currently for any form that's filed between a tenant and the landlord to be filed anywhere else. So IRAC has no idea how many of these have been filed already. We do, to some extent, because we've been hearing from people and helping them with the forms. Um, but currently, it's one of the gaps. The other piece around that is, as we discussed yesterday, is that um, while we recognize that most landlords are absolutely acting in good faith, they operate their businesses appropriately, it doesn't take very many bad faith actors to damage the reputation, and we, we absolutely have encountered those bad faith landlords in our work with our constituents. Part of the challenge we have there is, again, unless somebody feels brave enough to say that this has happened to them, it's just happening. Because, again, there's no requirement. Um, so the other challenge that we have with this, it was raised by my colleague yesterday, for this particular amendment, Chair, is um, the, how important the communications is. And then the second piece is, going forward, our rent control only works if everybody participates, because we haven't legislated a requirement. We know that a rental registry is the way to do that most effectively. Will your department consider a rental registry, either now or in the future, to fill that gap? Yeah. <coughs> I'm going to let uh, Vernon speak on this because okay. I know uh, himself and uh, other department members have been working on this. So. Okay. okay, thank you. Sure. Well, and, and so the first, the, your first point towards um, filing a notice with IRAC, uh, as part of the home search, the minister mentioned, we are looking at adding um, some wording in there that evictions will have to be filed with the director. Um, so we haven't got that quite finalized yet. I can't guarantee what the wording would say exactly, but we are looking at it. It's wording in that evictions will have to be filed um, 
So that's that is one. They're not with IRAC really, with the director, but yeah. uh, with the director's office. So we, we're having that discussion, um, and I haven't got the final wording just yet. That is one of the final items that we're working on right now. <coughs> Excuse me. In terms of a rental registry, um, I, I don't know, minister, but uh, I don't think there's a. a thought process right now on a complete rental registry that would have, you know, all of the items in terms of rent, address, name. There's a lot of different work to be done on that area, and uh, I don't think that's not currently anticipated for this act, for the RTA. But again, I, we're, yeah. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. Uh, there is a rental registry currently. It has a thousand units registered in it, and it's been built entirely by volunteers, and it has exactly that information. It even has the receipts in a secure server associated with each record that provide the evidence of there being um, rents charged you know, on a historical basis. And it's been used by tenants to get back almost $200,000 in illegally paid rent. So um, it was built in a weekend by volunteers uh, and has been maintained for a year by volunteers. So we absolutely can do it. It's it's. It's about whether we recognize why we need one. And, and you know, it has been raised consistently with your predecessors and with your department that when we have rent control, but rent control is only as good as the enforcement of rent control. And if rent control relies on everybody to be acting in good faith, as soon as you have any actors in that space who are not acting in good faith, it stops working. And that is the case because we've had to return $200,000 in over overcharged rent. And that's only in the 1,000 units out of the 19,000 units that are in PEI. Um, and so um, I know that this is uh, the context chair in this, uh, for this, in this amendment is um, that none of these notices, we have no record anywhere that any of these notices have been served. I'm really excited to hear that you're going to require record recording of evictions in the future but we have to record everything uh, if we're not recording everything in an open and transparent way we will continue to have failures and tenants are in a power imbalance in that relationship tenants if they complain are going to lose their home the landlord could just get another tenant right so so i minister i know that you've heard this but yes, I think sir. now you're in your new space i think you're hearing it a different way than you might have heard it before no sir certainly i know it, it's been brought up and my predecessor was working behind the scenes on this i, I believe there um is possibly a report uh, that that was done which i haven't seen yet but i, I don't mind taking a look at it uh, my question was the registry i, I feel it's got to go both ways because mm -hmm. we have we have good landlords, bad landlords, and we have good tenants and bad tenants. And one going concern I've heard by a lot of landlords is uh, certain tenants don't pay rent, for example. And it's the same tenants reoccurring over and over that don't pay rent, but the landlords aren't knowledgeable about that because there's no, in a sense, way to f a registry to find a, such a bad tenant, right? And, and the last one I just had from a, a landlord, uh, very good faith, he... he basically fell for the excuses of this person of, uh, of not getting uh, the, the rent and he was owed $4,000 and come to find out that that same individual went through seven different properties in two years. Uh, but the landlord wouldn't be aware of that. So I, I certainly think there's an avenue, but I think it's got to be both. And I do think landlords and tenants, I think there needs to be a registry for both. How do we ever get there? I'll be honest, I don't know, uh, but I certainly think it's worth exploring. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. I need to make a, a real clarification there, Minister. I'm not talking about a tenant or landlord registry. It's never called a landlord registry. It's a rental registry. We don't actually, in a rental registry, record a landlord's name because it's not the, the, the rent doesn't isn't associated to a landlord. The rent's associated to the property. So if you look at the rental registry, it's by civic address. It actually uses a civic address registry to, to build. So there's never any mention of the landlord name, and they're not available to the public because that would be a, a breach of privacy, right. as, as would the same thing for a tenant. It's actually in breach of privacy laws to maintain a database like that. Uh, it's a federal offense. So, yeah, so, the, so the rental registry, when there's a record of a landlord, it's not available to the public. It's in a separate secure server, and it only becomes available if somebody needs to go to court. Okay. And then what they do is they're provided with that, that data so they can go to court, which, which obviously is appropriate. But we need to be really clear. It's a difference between what we have as, here, which is fantastic in our legislation, is that the rent is associated with the property. 
So you don't need to have names associated. And what, what we're doing is trying to say that a tenant should be charged fairly. And I guess that's where I, I don't know enough on it, because I'm thinking it's not too hard. If the, if the civic address is there, you can get on to GeoLink, punch in the civic address, and find out who owns that property. So I would need to know a little more info on it, but I certainly don't mind sitting down and, and trying to get my head around it with you. Okay. My last, my last point, Chair, is that the, uh, the report on the rental registry was done by Stantec. It was completed last yep. October, uh, so you've had it for a year. It would be, your, your department has had it for a year, and it would be great to table that publicly um, because nobody knows what's in it, but we know who was interviewed for it. So it would be, it has definitely been around for a while and, and um, would be helpful to inform Yeah, the certainly. I don't mind going. I haven't seen it personally, but I don't mind going back to the department to, uh, to see what we can do on that. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And as I've just been kind of listening, every question that I had has been addressed. I guess I will just take the opportunity to kind of second um, the, the idea of a rental registry. I think I'm, I'm starting to look at this uh, in terms of layers of protection, almost like COVID, you know, and so having that information that isn't pointing fingers, but simply stating facts mm -hmm. so that we have something to base it off of, because right now we have no way of knowing, right? We have no way of knowing what an illegal rent increase is. And so I'll just, I just want to put my support in for that. And really thank you for, for bringing this forward. Charlottetown Winslow. Thanks, Eric, and thank you, Minister, for uh, bringing this forward. Um, so I kind of started some questions with this yesterday, but um, I guess my first question would be, so how, how you had mentioned that you're in the process of trying to let all of the landlords know, and, you know, I, I do see that that can be tricky somehow because, again, some of the landlords that have reached out to me might be those people that maybe own one rental or own a duplex or own two duplexes. And, you know, their first comment to me was like, oh, my goodness, this is crazy, you know. So that's my first question is how, how are you letting, when you say you're going to let all these landlords know, how, how are you going to do that? Yeah, so uh, there, there's a couple things. Obviously, um, I've had a lot of calls in the last 24 hours, as I'm sure everybody else has. Um, but to explain, there's a lot of nervousness with the landlords as well, and and I'm, I'm trying to explain uh, to everyone, landlord-wise, that there is supports coming. The departments are working on them. Um, we are going to meet again with, uh, with the Landlord Association uh, and exactly that uh, of what we are trying to do within a couple of weeks. And I know it's pretty overwhelming for the landlords with me coming with this leg legislation. There's a lot of anger there and I can't say as I, I blame them um, but at the same time I, uh, I think if a couple weeks uh, later here we're going to be able to, to show where we're going with this and I think it'll be a peace of mind for, for a lot of landlords um, obviously I, I'm talking to landlords and saying please let your other friends and landlords know what we're doing um, and truthfully as angry as a lot of the messages have come in and, and um, my poor daughter Kennedy can vote for it in the drive down I want to talk to them personally instead of just sending an email and explain what we're trying to do, and I find it's a peace of mind as well, just to know that uh, we are we are listening, and uh, and some of them have some great ideas. I talked to a, a landlord this morning for for a couple of simple in initiatives that could possibly work. So uh, we're going to sit down with the landlord association again here very soon and uh, kind of work with them to see what we can come up with. Charlotte Town Winslow. Thank you, Chair. I just have one more quick question, and I, I do thank you for that. And uh, I, you know, again, you know. We get both sides of it, right? Of course, when the announcement was first made, the 10.8% increase, uh, you know, you have a lot of people reaching out, like, I, I can't afford to pay that. And then when you had made, came out and made the announcement, you know, 0%, and, you know, people are saying, well, that, you know, I, I'm going to lose money, or I'm going to end up losing money on that. So, and I also liked your idea of, you know, because, again, sometimes we don't hear the stories of having, you know, some of the tenants, you know, that are maybe a little bit late or delinquent on some of their payments and everything. So, anyway, um, you know, my, my last question, sorry, Chair, to get to the point, I guess, having that zero percent, is that maybe something that might stop or slow down a development if, you know, someone had an idea of, you know, I was going to put up a unit or I was planning to build a unit in the next little bit, but, you know, if I'm seeing that there's a zero percent rate increase, or maybe it won't affect a new unit, I don't know. Well, I think certainly they'd be questioning, the landlords would be questioning any future development right now with that because it's got to be profitable or they're not going to do it. And and there's kind of a, a two-stage approach here. The, the first stage is, okay, what can we do to help the landlords over this next 12-month period until we can get more housing in the market? But the separate conversation we're having now is what we can do to incentivize developers and landlords to build. And, and over the coming weeks, you're going to see a very 
aggressive uh, development housing plan that the private sector, NGOs, municipalities can all uh, work towards to try and get housing in, in the market. Um, all along, I said it's going to be a, a, an approach where we need to work with absolutely everybody. Uh, the only way we're going to solve this is to put more housing in the market, and the only way to do that is incentivize absolutely uh, every contractor, developer, municipality, and NGO to work towards that, as well as government building themselves. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we're at the end of round one. We're going to move on to round two. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, sorry, Chair. Uh, probably this is the right time for me to introduce an amendment that I have to this piece of legislation. Sure, if you have an amendment, you can read it into Hansford, I please. I will do that, and okay. I'll, uh, I know the clerk has copies of this. So the amendment reads as follows. <clears throat> Move that Clause 1B of Bill 80 is amended by the addition of the following after the proposed subsection 22, parenthesis 2. Notice by lesser. Sub 3, where a lesser has provided to a lessee a notice of a rent increase pursuant to order LR22-54 of the Commission that was stated to take effect in the period between January 1st, 2023 and December 21st, 2023, the lessor shall notify the lessee in writing and before January 21st, 2023 that the notice is of no force or effect. I can explain that to Chair. Um, do you have a seconder for that? Oh, yes, uh, Summerside Bowman. Thank you. And uh, so we'll have copies distributed to each member. Um, while that is being done, um, Leader of the Opposition, if you want to give just a brief explanation of why you put this uh, amendment forward. Right. It followed a conversation that we had yesterday actually regarding how we are going to make sure, as best we can, that tenants who have received a notice of uh, an increased rent based on the order, the order no, uh, referenced in that this amendment is the IRAC order, which prescribed the 10.8 and 5.2 percent increases, um, to, again, as best we can, ensure that those tenants will receive a second notice from the landlord notifying them that that first notice is now null and void. There's no ironclad way of doing this. I, I, I think government will do what it can. I think IRAC will put something up on their page, assuming this legislation passes. I think social media will be a tool. But I just look at this as one other tool of maxi maximizing the chance that we will reach every um, tenant who has received a notice to make sure that they are aware that it is now null and void. That's the intent of this piece, this amendment. Thank you very much. Uh, response? Yeah, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Honourable Member, for the amendment. Um, I, I understand where where we're trying to go with it, and, and I agree. My, my only fear with it is uh, there's nothing that's saying that the landlord will do that, and there's no. But at the end of the day, it's another avenue, um, so I've got no problem supporting it. I think the government will do what they can as well, and, uh, and I'm sure IRAC. So. Um, like I say, I, I, I know it's probably not the answer, but it, it certainly is not going to hurt the legislation by putting it in there, so I support it. Okay, Honourable Members, the floor is now open to anyone who wants to speak on this amendment. No one, so we shall go to a... Okay, uh, Rustico Emerald. Well, uh, thank you, Chair. And I understand the, the motive behind the, the amendment because the communication with, uh, with tenants is really important and understanding their rights and understanding what's going on is a tough thing to communicate and always been very challenging and uh, to the comments I think it was the member from Summerside Wilmot had, had spoke about and she might even ask questions on it uh, um, she had talked about how we you know basically make sure that the regulations and legislation are are uh, enforced and communicated with the, with tenants and I mean one of the things that uh, I thought was a fantastic idea and I was advocating for, um, and maybe the, the minister will consider it here, the new minister, is um, this idea, like with Workers' Compensation Board, there's an office of the worker advisor and an office of the employer advisor. With, with the, the case of uh, tenants and landlords, there could be an office of the tenant advisor and an office of the um, landlord advisor or property owner advisor. And I think it would, uh, it would solve a, a, a lot of the issues um, and, uh, and I think it would help out with some of the issues I think that this amendment is, is, is trying to address. That way, um, you know, people would have a, a third party to go to that they, they could, uh, could
could talk to, and then that office could also be in charge, uh, responsible for helping communicate what was going on. And maybe I misunderstand the amendment, but uh, that's why I thought he was going with this. That's fine. Uh, I don't know. Well, I would, maybe I could ask the, the mover of the amendment as well if that's what he was intending it to do. Uh, the mover of the amendment has the floor. Um, no, sorry, I meant sorry. <laughs> The promoter has the floor. Thank, thank and, you, Chair. Yeah. And, and uh, I think the, the big thing for all MLAs to, to know is uh, that this amendment, it, it does not hurt the bill at all. It's another avenue, but uh, there's no way that we can enforce a landlord, and, and that uh, could could be an, uh, a problem there. But I think, uh, like I say, with what IRAC's prepared to do, what government's prepared to do, uh, I think that will get the message out, and uh, and uh, hopefully we can we can get this through. Thank you. Um, Russell Emerald, do you need more clarity on the amendment? Well, uh, I, I just wanted to know if, if uh, that was the sort of thing that the mover was intending this amendment to do. Maybe I misunderstand it. Okay. Um, leader of the Opposition? No, I, I can just reiterate what I sure. said, which is that we're trying to bring forward as many mechanisms as are available to make sure that tenants who have received a notice, and this would only apply to landlords who have issued a notice of, of rent increase, to make sure that they are told subsequently that that initial notice is now null and void. It's not creating any layer of bureaucracy or anything like that, simply a paper form. Or, you know, depending on how tenants and landlords stay in contact, it could be something as simple as an email. Uh, it's just written communication before January the 1st. Okay, Russell Emerald. Yes, no, and, and, and I, I think I do understand what you're saying, and, and in fact, that's, that's where I was going with this idea that um, outside of Iraq, and outside of the Department of Social Development and Housing, there actually would be an office of a tenant advisor, for example. That could be the ones that are monitoring this, as well as, as making sure that uh, that the they know who the tenants are that receive these letters, and there's a place for the tenants to come. But I'll, I'll leave it there. I don't think I need a response. Okay. Thank you. Is there any other discussion on the amendment? Shall the amendment carry? Yeah. Carry. Okay. Carried. Now back to speaking, Leader of the Opposition, to, no you have no more, okay. So back to speaking to the um, bill as amended, Summerside Winslow. Sorry. Summerside Wilmot. <laughs> yeah, that's a big, that's a big, big one. <laughs> the only other thing that I wanted to bring up, <laughs> sorry, that was distracting. Uh, the only other concern that I will raise is the same one that I raised in question period. I know that this will have an immediate effect of preventing the rent increases that are standard 5.2, 10.8, but there's nothing that precludes every one of those landlords for, from applying for an above the allowable rent increase and then going through. So while I'm delighted this is happening, I couldn't be more supportive of this piece of legislation. I will just ask you to bring the RTA with urgency because we are going to see a tremendous amount of people who have already received rent increases now going through a second process and their rent is still going to go up. It's going to have the same effect. And I know you had said yesterday that you recognize that lots of landlords are indeed struggling, but also we can't afford to have all of these folks homeless. We still can't afford to have them homeless if they file a form, I think it's four. You know, we, we still can't afford to have them homeless, so I will ask that the RTA comes with urgency, and thank you for your work on this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Rustico Emerald. Well, well, thank you, Chair. And um, I, I wanted to pick up on the debate uh, where I think it was the member from Charlottetown Balvatier was talking about how, uh, and I'm, I'm glad she's kind of changed her tone on this, is that, you know, that the vast majority of landlords are good and they, and they do follow the rules and they are providing a very valuable service in this province. And um, in fact, they care a lot about their tenants. And I've talked to landlord after landlord after landlord who have, have said in, in the past, um, and you can look back over the history, they've been relatively uh, low uh, yearly allowable rent increases. They haven't even raised the rent for the tenants. They do care, and it really is a small uh, number of bad apples that spoil the barrel. And, um, and, and frankly, when I look at this 0% number, um, I, I scratch my head, because uh, I don't understand why it couldn't be 1% or 2% or even 3%, because I really don't believe that landlords should have to shoulder 
Um, the costs that have, have increased primarily from, from heating costs due to inflation and, in, and the price of, uh, of heating oil going, but also property tax increases. I really don't believe they should have to shoulder those costs alone. And the 0% sends a strong signal that, you know, the landlords are going to have to pay. Now, I know the minister has said on the floor that there's going to be some plans in the near future that, you know, we're they're somehow going to help the landlords out, and I, and I hope there are. But I think the 0% number um, treats all tenants the same, treats all landlords the same, and, and sends the wrong message uh, to, to landlords about the value that they add in our system. I mean, I really believe that um, when it comes to to uh, rental units that the our, our private uh, landlords do a, a fantastic job and in, in many cases do it in a very efficient fashion. We could argue all day about whether they do it more efficiently than government. I think they probably do. And I think that this 0% increase adds a significant risk that landlords, well, frankly, they'll get out of the rental business. And uh, whether that means government is growing and getting more into the rental business, which would be less efficient, or we'll see the number of rental units on the island reduced, I think it's a bad thing. And I, I, have, I really have a hard time, you know, supporting a bill that uses that 0% number. I want to know from the minister, why didn't you use the number, like, say, 3%? I think up to 3% would be a much more reasonable thing to do. Uh, thank you. Uh for your statement, honourable members. So, uh, obviously, that was looked at, and, and we do feel that uh, we can fulfil uh, the the big gap on the landlords with programs. We've heard what the issues are on the programming side, and uh, uh, we've listened loud and clear, and we feel that uh, that we can uh, work towards uh, fulfilling that. Uh, obviously, there is a fear on the landlords, uh, um, just getting fed up with being in the rental business. Uh, but I'm quite confident with the programs that we're rolling out, that's going to get them through the next 12 months but also uh, the initiatives uh, that's going to help them to develop further, uh, get the RTA through and uh, get a, a long-term vision of how, uh, how this looks for the province. So uh, I know uh, it's pretty overwhelming for them right now, but uh, I'm quite confident in the next couple of weeks when we roll out some programs, it's, uh, it's going to uh, help them get through this and uh, move on to, uh, to expanding and growing. Okay. Larry Inverness. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, you know, I've been listening to the debate and uh, followed it as best I can. And I've had a lot of, uh, of uh, constituents reach out to me uh, uh, over the evening, the last night, and things of that nature. And I, I have a, my biggest challenge with all of this is that you're overruling an independent body in uh, setting up uh, the, what their decision was. Now. Uh, the problem and where, what some of the landlords are telling me or the developers are telling me is that it sets a precedence that how are you going to get back out of that? If you do it once, you can do it twice or three times or whatever. And uh, so, so then, it, it, then it's, it's saying to them as developers, I can't control uh, a reasonable or get a reasonable shake in uh, pitching my idea to develop a project or what the rent should be. And I, I was of the assumption a little bit on yesterday that there was going to be something in the capital budget. I wasn't sure how that was going to work that would state there was something here to, to make that happen. And I don't see that. I, I mean, I, I see there's money for housing in the capital budget. But you're asking me to support something that's going to help landlords. You're going to do something with landlords, but I have no idea what it is. Why, why isn't there a, a, a program that says, you vote for this, I can understand that, I can talk to my landlords uh, in the, the Ryan of Valeria and Vernas and see what they think. Now it's a complete leap of faith that you're going to deliver something. So is there a reason why you didn't make this announcement uh, at the same time as you're trying to pass this bill? Thanks for the question, Honourable Member. So the legislation in front of you today is uh, to put a 0% freeze so tenants' rates don't go up. Yeah, it's got nothing to do with landlords and the programming. Um, so the joys of being elected member, you have a free vote and you're going to yep. vote on your conscience and what you think is best for your riding of Larry Inverness like you always do. Um, so what I can say is that we intervene, not that we want to intervene, but there would be hundreds of people on the street without housing. And God forbid it ever happened that somebody uh, passes away or 
something tragic happens because they didn't have a home knowing that we could have done something about it. Um, and that's where we're at today. I didn't take this decision lightly. And I know I'm not very popular with the landlords right now because of it, um, but I assure them there is programs coming. We need landlords and developers to get us out of this situation that I said yesterday that government has caused. And we will strive towards that. And I'm quite confident with the programs that we're going to roll out is going to help the landlords with the faces and the challenges they're facing right now. Old Larry and Vanessa. But see, some of the challenges you're dealing with here, you're dealing with the capital budget, you're dealing with the legislation that's saying January 1st. If you're doing something that's going to be beyond into the next fiscal year, uh, your, your increases are starting here January 1st. You're not going to probably have any real significant programs that are going to come out until next fiscal year. I'm just kind of, that's an assumption. But, and, and my argument would be why I'm saying that is that if you were have the money in this fiscal year, why didn't you make that announcement uh, tomorrow, today, yesterday, uh, you know, whatever, so we, I would have something to gauge this on. So I'm going to assume that the rental increases are going to be to the, or that there's going to be no rental increases come January 1st. You're not going to have any uh, help for, for developers, landlords until into April. Uh, you know, that, that's a problem that I, I'm sort of faced with on all of this. And, and you're right, I do have the, to vote my conscience on this in that regard. But I just want to fundamentally say that when you overrule a regulatory body, you're, you're going on a slippery slope as a government. And uh, it makes you wonder why they would even want to do the duties that they do. And then it's also the pressure is going to be put on you for every other commodity or issue that they regulate. It's going to say, well, why, why, aren't, why isn't government intervening on this one? Because I would argue fuel prices going up is, is a significant impact on everybody as well. So, uh, so that's, that's where I sort of see this. And I've got developers in my district are saying, because if you're overruling the regulatory body on this, I'm not going to uh, proceed with my project. Now, you, you might be able to provide some incentives later on down the road, but that's a leap of faith for me as a constituent or as an MLA representing constituents. So I just wanted to put that on the record that that's my biggest concern. I, I'm all for tenants and I don't want to see people going out. One landlord was saying to me he's been a good landlord. He hasn't done the increases over the years to maybe what was allowable. Now he's left with now the, his costs have gone up quite a bit. He would like to have put in the rent up. Now he can't even get anything on that. And he's he's a good landlord. He's got good buildings, and he's left now, you know, having to eat this somehow. And I don't know what your projects of uh, or funding is going to be to incentivize him, but he he probably doesn't have to do a whole lot of renovation. He doesn't have to do a whole lot. I don't know what could be there for him. So, and I would have been supportive of rent supplements if you were doing that. Then, then, then the province of PEI, the taxpayers of PEI, are bearing that burden. Mm -hmm. And we supplement the rent. Everybody kind of comes out of that a better winner, I think, than what, you, what you're proposing here. So I just wanted to put that on the record, Chair, and uh, I'm going to have a hard time supporting this, but we'll see, we'll see as the vote goes on. Here. Thank you very much, Larry Vanessa. Um, so I also have a question, a few questions, too, and it's very similar to the same concerns that Larry and Vanessa has. And um, I know you said that. There's no relation between the um, uh, the landlords and this bill, but there really is for me to have the confidence to vote for it. I need to know what incentives are going to be there for the landlords, uh, for the property owners, in order to support this. To be quite honest, and that's that's where I struggle. So what I can tell you, every landlord that I've talked to, there's four issues: the price of fuel, the price of property tax, mm -hmm. uh, insurance. And mortgage interest, rate. interest mm -hmm. rates going up and renewable mortgage so the departments all across government are looking at them four key things right now and while this sitting of the legislature we will be coming out with programs landlords will not be waiting until april and we have departments that are working on all this right now and uh, once i have some info that i can be able to provide we cer certainly will but our main focus right now is to make sure that nobody goes homeless and that the landlords do not go broke uh, with this uh, zero percent uh, no increase so that's what we're striving for and uh, we are going to get there Okay, thank you. I, and I do have confidence in you and your, in what you say. Um, I take you for your word. Uh, you haven't let me down in the past, so I have to, to use that in my equation. But again, there's nothing, you know, it's, there's nothing right there in, in writing Certainly. for it. So um, I have, you, you talked about the landlords and that. Did you, and I, and I might have missed this earlier, I was trying to pay attention to it all, but did you speak to the Residential Rental Association of Prince Edward Island and 
because I, I guess they advocate for all uh, landlords on Prince Edward Island. Yes. And what was their feedback other than those four that you just said? Yeah, Anything I've, else? I've met with them on two occasions. Um, obviously, they were pushing for the 10.8 percent increase. Mm -hmm. um, they made some great points in both meetings. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind they're incurring significant costs with the cost of inflation and everything we've talked about. Um, their margins are tight with the 1% every year. Uh, probably hasn't been enough and we've seen exactly why the 10.8 has come into effect that's created the, the, the problem. Um, so everything they say is 100% accurate and uh, I, I don't believe the statement when I hear landlords got too much money or every landlord is different. Uh, I've talked to uh, large landlords and I've talked to small landlords. I had a conversation uh, with, a, with a gentleman this morning that only has one duplex unit. Uh, his, uh, him and his spouse both work and they're just trying to pay the bills on it, right? They're not looking to make money. They're just trying to pay the mortgage and keep it afloat. So every landlord is different, but all the issues are the same. So them four issues I've brought up, doesn't matter big or small, them are all the issues and this is what we're working towards to, to help. Okay, thank you. And I, and I did hear from landlords too um, that the um, of, of, of the similar concerns, uh, many of them were a little bit um, concerned of the impact of, that this may have um, on their um, units that they have now. Mm -hmm. I've had some, or even the way this whole this whole um, rental is going, they had concerns. I had one in, in my area who didn't want to deal with this and sold 32 apartments. Mm -hmm. um, and I have others who right now are uncertain whether they want to 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 build um, just because of that uncertainty. So I, I do struggle with that. Mm -hmm. um, I do appreciate your explanation on this. I do understand from the rental uh, perspective, um, you know, with inflation and, but it's the unknowns and it's the unknowns with the the impact it will have on the landlords um, that I, I really struggle with. So um, next on the list, I have Tyne Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you, Chair. And um, I won't take too long, but I just I wanted to say that I absolutely am going to support this legislation. It's absolutely needed. Um, if we were to allow those rental increases, most certainly we would see uh, many islanders uh, on the streets, as you said, that they wouldn't be able to pay make make ends meet. There's no doubt. But I want to note. I just I just want this on the record that quite honestly. Um, I'm not I'm not prepared to just you know pat you on the back for this minister because you know you're swooping in at the last minute like Superman that's great but we should never have been in this position in the first place we have been stressing for years that there needs to be a cap on rental increases and what has happened as a result we didn't put that cap didn't put that cap and boom look what happened we had this uh, outrageous number come from Iraq that at a time when people absolutely can't afford it so, you know, I, I find this, uh, I just wanted to state that on the record that, uh, you know, you're, you're swooping in, saving the day last minute, but as has been noted by other colleagues uh, here in the legislature, you know, this is causing a lot of disruption. It's caused a lot of disruption for, you know, we've heard a lo little bit about some of the landlord's concerns uh, from some of our members from the third party. Uh, we've heard quite a bit uh, from uh, colleagues in my caucus about, uh, you know, renters who were given these notices and the incredible anxiety and stress that caused. And, you know, I'm glad that we passed the amendment to, to ensure, to do everything we can to ensure they'll know that's not going to happen. But I just, uh, I wanted to stress that, well, I'm glad this is happening. I'm glad this, you're bringing this legislation. It, we should never, ever have been in this position. And I find it very frustrating that we are. Yeah. Thank you. So are there any other members who would like to speak on the bill as amended? Shall the bill as amended carry? Sure. Carried. When he comes back. I move the title. An act to amend the rental of residential property act number two. Shall it carry? I move the enacting clause. Uh, be it enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and let the chair report the bill agreed to with amendment. Shall it carry?
Mr. Speaker's Chair, the Committee of the Whole House having under consideration the bill to be intitled an act to amend the rental or residential property act number two, I beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to the same with amendment. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Sure, Carrie. Carrie, Carrie. Standing vote. Honourable members. <coughs> Sergeant Arms, you may ring the bell. Put the little whip to work. Put the little whip to work. Honourable members, those voting against the bill, please stand. As amended. The honourable member from Rustico Elmer, uh, Emerald, pardon me. The honourable member from O'Leary and Verness, and the honourable member from Tignish Palmer Road. Those voting for the bill, please stand. The Honourable Minister of Finance, the Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities, the Honourable Member from Morel Dona, the Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Land, and the Minister of Justice and Public Safety, pardon me, <laughs> and Deputy Premier. The Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action, the Honourable Men Member from Stratford Kinlaw, Capic, pardon me, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Winslow, the Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, the Honourable Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning, the Minister for Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture, the Honourable Member of, of Social Development and Housing, and the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition, the Honourable Member from Summerside Wilmot, the Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Victoria Park, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Belvedere, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Brighton, the Honourable Member from Tyne Valley Sherbrooke, and the Honourable Member from Summerside South Drive. Honourable Members, the bill has passed. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Land, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of uh, Environment, Energy and Climate Action that the 20th order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? Order number 20, Miscellaneous Statute Amendment Act 2022, number 2, Bill number 75, ordered for second reading. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Land, Minister of Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action that this House do now resolve itself to the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration said bill. Should I carry? The Honourable Member from Tignish Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker, to chair the Committee of the Whole House, please. I thought we did. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I thought it was a second. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the member or the Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action that the said bill be read a second time. Shall I carry? Miscellaneous Statutes Amendment Act 2022, number two, bill number 75, read a second time. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture and Land, Minister Res Response. Minister of Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Speaker. Premier. <laughs> uh, Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action that this House do now resolve itself in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration said bill. Sure, Carey. The Honourable Member from Tignish Pomerol, Deputy Speaker, Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please.
Honourable Committee of the whole House to take into consideration the bill to be in titled Miscellaneous Statutes Amendment Act 2022, number 2. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? granted. Good afternoon. Would you please state your name and position for Hansard? Blair Barber, Legislative Specialist for the Department of Justice and Public Safety. Thank you very much, Blair, and welcome. Uh, Promoter, would you like to begin by giving just a brief explanation of the bill's intent? Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the bill updates uh, references in various statutes to reflect the succession of King Charles III. Thank you. Honourable members, it's not a pleasure of the committee that the bill be read um, section by section or open it as uh, just general questions. Okay. So it is now open for general questions. Any questions? Yeah. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. Just one chair for my own clarification. What one would expect, given the prominence of the mon monarchy in all of our lives, that it would take more than one amendment to a single bill to fix all of government uh, legislation, but it, uh, clearly that's not the case. Uh, no, Member. Uh, as you might recall, we had a miscellaneous statute amendment act 2022. That would be the number one. That dealt with, uh, it was a larger bill, dealt with a number of the statutes uh, where we had references to Her Majesty, so we've updated those. Uh, this particular bill, uh, part two, uh, deals with those pieces that we couldn't quite deal with in advance of, of the death of Her Majesty. Uh, so some of the things we're looking at are renaming the Queen's printer as the King's printer and changing the title of that office as enabling legislation. Uh, references to Her Majesty's Armed Forces are being changed to His Majesty's Armed Forces. Uh, we're changing references to Her Majesty. They're containing court forms and oaths of office that specifically reference uh, Queen Elizabeth II. And we're also amending the Legal Profession Act's provisions with respect to the designation of, of uh, Queen's Council. So that will now be King's Council. So uh, this piece and the previous piece, uh, if people dive into it, there are numerous statutes throughout that we've tried to update and uh, bring into the, the 21st century. Uh, one of the pieces we're doing is uh, where it references Her Majesty in right of the, the Crown, or the uh, in right of the province of Prince Edward Island. We're referencing the government. So certain references like that uh, will never need to be changed again on the succession of the throne. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, really appreciate that very clear explanation, Blair. Thank you very much. And also the incredible utility and efficiency of this piece of legislation. Thank you. I'm good. Thanks, Any other Chair. questions? Shall the bill carry? Carried. Yeah. Carried. Uh, Mr. Chair. Um, promoter? Sorry, uh, Chair, we do have an amendment. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> I was not aware. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's, it's one word. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. which is important. Uh, so the motion amends subsection 4-2 uh, of Bill Number 75 to add the missing word except uh, to the substituted words the government. So, um, so it's, uh, instead of the government, it's except the government. So, okay. are there any questions on the amendment? Shall the amendment carry? Carry. Shall the bill as amended carry? Carry. Carry. Yeah. I move the title. A miscellaneous Statutes Amendment Act 2022, number two. Shall it carry? Carry. I move the, the enacting clause. Be it enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Carry. Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and let the chair report the bill agreed to with amendment. Shall it carry?
Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having on the consideration the bill to be in titual Miscellaneous Statutes Amendment Act 2022 number 2, I beg leave to report that the Committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed the same with amendment. I move that the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall it carry? Ready? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Land, Minister of Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Speaker. Premier. Deputy Premier. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the uh, Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action that the 12th order of the day be now read. Charlotte Carey. Order number 12, an act to amend the Workers' Compensation Act number 2, Bill number 68, ordered for second reading. The Honourable Deputy Speaker. <laughs> the Honourable Premier. Deputy, Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier. <laughs> you have a lot of <laughs> Having a bad day. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the <laughs> Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action that the said bill be read a second time. Shall I carry? Bill number 68, an act to amend the Workers' Compensation Act number 2, read a second time. The Honourable Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action that this House do now resolve itself in a committee the whole House to take into consideration said bill. Sure, Carey. The Honourable Member from Tignish, Pomeroy, Deputy Speaker, Chair of the Committee of the Whole, please. Now, the committee of the whole house to take into consideration a bill to be intitled an act to amend the Workers' Compensation Act number two. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? Good afternoon. Would you please state your name and title for answer? Stephen Carpenter, Senior Legal Advisor with the Workers' Compensation Board. Thank you, Stephen, and welcome. Uh, Thank promoter, you. would you like to begin by giving a brief statement on the bill's intent? Sure. Uh, the proposal is to enhance benefits for injured workers, increasing the cap on the CPI adjustments from 4 to 6 percent, increasing wage loss replacement from 85 to 90, and changing the way we calculate minimal in, uh, insurable earnings and expanding the coverage for final expenses. Thank you very much, honourable members. Um, would you now like to have the bill read clause by clause, section by section, or open it up to general questions? General questions? Time Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, and I'm uh, very uh, looking forward to discussing this uh, bill and getting some, uh, I have a couple of questions, um, certainly. Uh, one of the things I've raised in the past around um, CPI increases and the impact on injured workers is that um, we've seen this this change over time, right? So this isn't the first time that we've adjusted or that government has adjusted the uh, percentage uh, increase uh, of CPI over the years. So can you just tell me a little bit about um, sort of what other adjustments have been made in the past? I mean, we're, at, we're you're moving this up to 90. Um, you know, how much has this changed over the years? This percent. Do you want me to handle that? Um, I believe it started somewhere in the range of 75% of net um, earnings. It's moved to 80. Uh, most recently, it's 85. And with this proposed amendment, it would move uh, to 90%. Just for a little bit of context, we would be the first jurisdiction in Atlantic Canada to move to 90% of, of benefits of um, pre-accident earnings. Across Canada, uh, I can't give you exact numbers, but I think around half of the provinces or slightly less than half are at 90%, most are below 90%. So we would be somewhat of a leader with this with this change. Time Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Chair. And, you know, I, 
again, it's certainly good to see an increase uh, in, 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 in benefits, this indexed increase uh, uh, to 90 percent of, of wages. Uh, but, I, you know, I do have to note, I mean, you know, we, you noted that this is, we would be the first Atlantic Canadian province. But I, I've always, I find it strange that we, you know, not strange, really unacceptable that we, we are still going at less than 100 percent, honestly. I mean, we're talking about workers who were injured, you know, at their, at their job, you know, doing their job, doing just, you know, and their, their wage uh, ability to earn has been impacted, you know, sometimes for years, sometimes for the rest of their life, right? So, you know, maybe just to, to question to the minister, I mean, do you feel that, you know, does, what does this say really about how we value those workers? Uh, is, is, is an injured worker worth, you know, 90% of a person? Call the hour. The hour has been called. I guess you're back. So what time is it tomorrow? Is it two or three? Or oh, no, half the yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Mr. Chair, I move the speaker take the chair and that the chair pro progress and beg to sit again. Shall it carry? Carried. Carry. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having on consideration a bill to be intitulated an act to amend the Workers' Compensation Act No. 2, I beg leave, to, beg leave to report that the Committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move that the report of the Committee be adopted. So carry. The Honourable Member from Morale, Dona, and the Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move uh, second by the Minister of Finance that this House adjourn until November 3rd at 1 o'clock in the p.m. Sean Carey. Carey. Have a good evening.